Welcome. I'm Beth Gerson. I'm the chair of the Conway Planning Board, and these are the members of the Planning Board. I'm Jennifer Mullins. I'm the co-chair of the Planning Board. I'm Susan Fenton. I'm just a proud member. <laughs> this is Joe Stokowski, the associate member. And we also have with us on the Zoom George Forcier, a planning board member who is taking uh, our minutes tonight, and Bill Mabius, uh, another planning board member. And over there on the other side of the room is... James, Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm Mark Silverman. Peter Jeswold. Phyllis Crane. And Andy Lovecheck is up there. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> so the purpose of this hearing is to allow review and comment on the special permit application of vertex tower assets to construct a 150 foot 156 at the highest appurtenance monopole wireless facility at 1365 ashfield road conway before we start this uh hearing here's some details this meeting as you can tell is both in person and over zoom I personally haven't conducted uh, public hearings this way, and we are anticipating a number of people attending through the Zoom. Let's all recognize this is new to many of us, and this may be less than perfect. <laughs> That's okay. We're all doing the best we can. I'm asking for everyone to be respectful as well as mindful of time. We requested that people sit at a bit of a distance in your own comfort level. We're leaving some windows open. There are maps near the entryway. here is aware of their own risk level and will act accordingly. If you are attending via Zoom, please make sure your mic is on mute. If you're calling in via phone, following commands can be entered using your keypad. If you say star six, that will mute and unmute you. If you star nine, that will raise and lower your hand and we'll see it on the Zoom and we can um, know that you're waiting to ask a question. Everyone is required to sign in, either on the sign-in sheets if in person, which are right there, <laughs> right there, and in the chat if you're attending by Zoom, your name, full address, and affiliation, if any, are required. This hearing is bound by the laws of Massachusetts pertaining to public meetings. This hearing is being recorded, as you heard before, uh, both for Zoom, minutes are being taken, and FK, uh, Frontier Community Access Television is here. We'll post the recording on the town website. We also have our, indi our independent consultant, Fred Goldstein, you can see his name there, of uh, Interrail Consulting through Zoom to answer questions pertaining to his report. So we'll be able to direct questions to him. A uh, copy of the report, we do have a paper copy of it here. If people want to see it, it's also on the website. Um, Vertex Tower Assets Representative Cram Parisi is here tonight to present, as well as Tom Johnson, the project engineer. So, uh, here's the order of the hearing. The applicant presents. Zoning board members ask questions. Planning board members ask questions. Then if anyone is here from the select board, they can ask a question or two. <laughs> Um, other town departments, fire, highway, police, board of health, they are recognized next. Other town committees and boards, conservation commission, open space, whoever's here from other committees and boards. Assessors, yes. Um, abutters to the property are recognized next. And then members of the public who are county residents and then others who are members of the public are recognized. To be recognized to speak, please raise your hand if you're here in the room. Please put your request into the chat if you're on Zoom. <coughs> we have um, um, some people keeping track of that. I'm requesting a time limit for public comments of five minutes per comment. Please give others a chance to speak if you have already spoken. Um, thanks, everyone. So we're going to call this joint public hearing to order at 7.05 p.m. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, good evening. My name is Francis Parisi, uh, representing the applicant Vertex Tower Assets LLC. Also with me tonight is Tom Johnson, the civil engineer who designed the project and has been on the site many times. Um, with the chair's permission, is it possible I could share my screen? Because I have a presentation that uh, um, um, with some maps and photos and 
lots of talking points. Uh, yes. Um, you we may already have that option. You may already have that option. I, I think you gave me permission. Let me just see here real quick. Is that okay with you, other chair? Okie dokie. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. As was written in the notice here, we are here tonight uh, jointly between the planning board and the zoning board. We require a special permit from the planning board and a variance from the zoning board. And given that the uh, um, uh, it's really the same project, uh, we found uh, that it would be more efficient. And I certainly appreciate the boards convening together because it's really the same information and the same data. And uh, uh, it's, it uh, just makes more sense to do it jointly. Um, um, we, as the board knows, filed an extensive application back in February uh, to both the planning board and the zoning board. We've had several really procedural pr uh, consultations with the board. I think we've had a total of three or four. Uh, we had a site visit back with the planning board and the zoning board about a week and a half ago and also conducted a visibility demonstration, which I have the photograph from tonight as well. Um, in addition, um, the board early on asked us to consult with the Conservation Commission. We felt that we were outside of jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, but given the extensive wetlands that are on the property that our engineers have taken great pains to avoid, um, um, we thought it was reasonable to go to the Conservation, go to the uh, Conservation Commission for a consultation, which we've done. We did a site walk with the, con with the Conservation Commission, independent of the site walk we did to the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, we had one public meeting uh, they asked us for a little bit more information, and we're going back to them, I believe, in two weeks. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm pretty confident, uh, based on the site walk, that we'll get through the uh, uh, Conservation Commission um, um, relatively unscathed. Uh, uh, specifically, we, uh, your zoning bylaw requires us to obtain a special permit uh, for all wireless telecommunication facilities. Um, in addition, your bylaw has, I don't want to say unusual, but a um, a fairly unusual comment that says that the uh, applicant needs to be a wireless carrier. And uh, 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 as the board knows, uh, we have used this word in front of the board before on the other side. And uh, um, after consultation with town council, uh, the board felt that that was an appropriate um, issue to deal with as a condition of this special permit. We have no intention of building this facility until we get a licensed carrier on board. Uh, we've had talks with several. It's just getting all the ducks in line and giving the extensive um, permitting process and engineering process and other due diligence. It's just hard to get everything in line at the same time. So uh, uh, we would agree to a condition similar to the last one that um, if the board were to approve the special permit, that we are not allowed to pull a building permit and convince commence construction until we show the board and the building inspector um, a uh, evidence of a, of a commitment from a licensed carrier. So uh, I guess we're seeking a condition as a condition of approval. Um, in addition, your zoning bylaw um, limits new towers to 120 <coughs> feet. And uh, as we'll talk about tonight, um, uh, that um, runs um, a foul of the technology, it runs afoul of the uh, other requirements of the bylaw that we, accom we, accom we uh, accommodate multiple telecommunications companies. And based on our research, we have felt that 150 feet is the appropriate height to accommodate multiple carriers so that we're not building something, and I, I hate the word use short sighted, uh, but uh, that, uh, you know, that we accommodate both current carriers, future carriers, and uh, we've done a lot of research in our back. So we're seeking a variance from the zoning board for that height limitation. Um, um, by way of introduction, and I know um, for members of the public, we've actually been in front of the planning board and the zoning board before um, on a, a similar site on the other side of town. It's, it's not an alternative to this, but so the boards have a, a familiarity with me and quite frankly my PowerPoint, but for the benefit of the public, I want to introduce Vertex. Vertex is what we call an infrastructure developer. We, uh, um, we are very experienced telecommunications professionals, a team of attorneys and engineers, and real estate professionals. Been, uh, muted. 
What's that? No. Thank you. Oh, I'm mad. Uh, okay, I got it. Um, we are a, a, a team of, of um, telecommunications. Is that on mute? I don't think so. Can we hold off for one minute while we figure out this new sound? Mary wants me to mute you, but I think you are the speaker, so I muted it. Turns the speaker off, so I okay. can't do that. Okay, but they just claiming there's bang on there. Is it is there um, like a feedback loop or yeah, something? That's what like you're that? saying. But I but that speaker So, so can minutes. I just interrupt for a second? For those of us on Zoom, by having Mr. Parisi speak through the owl, we are picking up all of the shuffling of people in the room as well as Mr. Parisi. If there's a way for Mr. Parisi to speak through, to mute the town administrator, Al, and speak through his computer, we will get less background noise. It's being very challenging on Zoom to understand what's, what he said. Can that happen, Jeremy? Yeah, so you want to go to join audio. I know, but I shut off my microphone, so we have to turn oh, on. All right. There we go. See because he he's got to use his audio. Yeah, I, I'm, unfortunately, the, I, I usually have the opposite, so I, have to, I, sh I usually shut off my microphone. Okay. So that's, I just got to turn it off. Now. This is the in slightly less than perfect part. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd get it out of the way really quickly. <laughs> just let me know when to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank now. you. <laughs> We're all learning it. We like that. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me on the Zoom? I think you, you have to go and yeah, click to here. join audio. You and then you have to set it up to join the computer audio. Yeah. If? What did Barry say? Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Parisi, if he's talking, is not coming through. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? You should be able to hear. Uh, you are muted. So the town administrator audio is muted. Uh, okay. 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 See, that's the problem. I think it's going to have to be. That's the problem. See, because I'm, see, cause I'm you hear, but you hear, but you hear. Okay. Can you mute the speaker on the owl? Well, that's what I just had muted, and it didn't seem to be working. Mute Joe's and turn this one on. Okay, I muted it right here. All right. I think. I think. I think. That's when I just unmuted myself. There's background noise coming through my microphone. All right. Can you sit closer to the owl, perhaps? Maybe that's a good idea. Yes. Well, it's, it's they're saying that they're hearing other people shuffling around, and it's kind of over there. We need to stop all the shuffling, please. Stop yeah. shuffling. I actually think there's no way to yeah. drop all the background noise. We're hearing background noise, too. We're just going to do the best we can. So maybe if you sit a little closer, that will help. Can you call into the Zoom meeting and read everything Somebody else? Mary said, so just go with the town administrator. Thanks for trying. Okay. Yeah. All right. Back to the loud even for us. <laughs> it's a loud loud. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. unmuted. Okay. We're rolling. Thank you. Okay. Can the folks on Zoom hear me now? Yes. Perfect. I'll try to speak louder. Um, <coughs> Thank you. 
Um, is Mr. Per okay. <laughs> it, by, again, by way of introduction, Vertex Tower is what we call a wireless infrastructure developer. We are a team of real estate professionals, uh, attorneys, engineers, radio frequency consultants that design wireless networks. Um, and um, what's happened in the world is that the, the names you've heard of before, Verizon and AT&T, have for the most part gotten out of the real estate business and they partner up with infrastructure developers like Vertex. Um, we've been doing this quite extensively in the um, um, western Massachusetts and rural New Hampshire market for several years now, and it's been very well received because we can be a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more cognizant of your zoning bylaw. Um, we um, develop infrastructure that accommodates multiple telecommunications companies, and uh, it's just a system that has worked. Um, by way of example, um, We've already been approved for a similar site on the other side of town in Conway. We were recently approved for a site in Ashfield. Uh, we just built a site in Coleraine. We built a site in Shutesbury. Uh, we built a site in Monterey, just south of the Mass Pike. We were just approved in Otis. We were approved in Rowe. And, um, um, and similarly in rural New Hampshire, similar markets in the um, rural areas, we built about six towers and uh, have permits for about 20 in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, the, uh, um, and it's just a model that, that tends to work because what happens is any one particular company, Verizon or AT&T, doesn't have the, I'd say the bandwidth, but they don't have the focus on Conway, New Hampshire, uh, Conway, Massachusetts, I'm sorry. Uh, we also have a site in Conway, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, and uh, um, so it, it allows us to do all the infrastructure work, which takes us several years. We've been working on this particular site for a couple of years now. It takes Tom and the engineers quite a bit of time to do the engineering. Going through the town process takes us time. And uh, you know, uh, uh, and like I said, we don't build it until the carriers commit, but we find that if we get farther along in the development process, they will come. Um, the, uh, uh, we filed a very extensive application package to both the planning board and the zoning board. I gave everybody everything, even though most of it probably isn't relevant to the Plant, the zoning board, but uh, um, we provided an immense amount of data that uh, um, that we can. Well, I'll kind of skim over tonight, but I have it all on the uh, computer if anyone wants to talk it. In addition, as part of the um, preliminary consultation, the planning board asked for some more data. Um, um, as was noted mainly by the conservation commission, the uh, the site has an extensive amount of wetlands that our engineers have done an extensive amount of work to avoid. And however, we provided uh, an immense amount of data um, showing the drainage calculations that our engineers, um, uh, and in addition, um, based on some um, feedback that I got from the planning board with respect to other construction projects in town and some of the people that might not have done things as diligently as our engineers do, um, we provided an, an immense amount of, of construction resources, photographs from other sites. Um, we call Tom the over-engineer because he develops sites. He's very conscious about stormwater running up <coughs> to a fault. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, and then what happens is we engage our, our engineers to supervise the construction process. We ultimately will go out and hire a construction contractor and Tom uh, and his team stand by them and make sure that it's constructed according to the plans that the planning board approves. In addition, um, as required by your bylaw, and as we talked about at previous planning board uh, preliminary meetings, we did a visibility demonstration. We put a balloon up in the air. We uh, uh, advertised it quite extensively in the Greenfield Reporter, notified all the abutters. I think it got some press as well in the Greenfield and on the news. And uh, we have the results of that tonight. I emailed them into the town yesterday. We just got them. Um, and then the last thing is, um, um, as part of the Conservation Commission process, they asked for a little bit more detail that I, I just sent to the planning board today. You probably haven't seen it yet. And I have some um, paper copies for the planning board. And really what it entailed was um, 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 the, there's an existing driveway off of Route 116 that we are utilizing uh, for the first um, several hundred feet into the property. Uh, and the day that we did our site visit with the Conservation Commission, it was quite muddy. Um, it was earlier in the spring. And uh, the Conservation Commission asked us to do some more 
driveway stabilization at the beginning of the driveway. We really weren't doing anything because we were just driving over the existing driveway, but um, our engineers concurred with the uh, Conservation Commission that maybe some stabilization was necessary. So as part of our construction project, we're gonna stabilize the existing driveway and we have some plans uh, to uh, um, support that. And then in addition, um, given I think some of the history that the town has had on other construction sites, um, they wanted to know what we were gonna do for long-term maintenance. Uh, and uh, uh, so we provided to the Conservation, or we will provide to the Conservation Commission, and we have for tonight uh, an operations and maintenance plan for the driveway to show not only will we build the driveway, but also maintain it over time so that it doesn't create any kind of uh, stormwater runoff or erosion. Uh, from our perspective, the driveways are very passive. Um, we, um, these facilities are unmanned, so the driveway that we build is really to facilitate construction. Uh, but because we build, so, we build, bring some heavy equipment up there, we build a very um, um, robust driveway and make sure that we have no impact on stormwater runoff. But then afterwards, these sites are, are unmanned, and someone might come by in a pickup truck like once a month just to check on it, but it's a very um, passive facility. It doesn't generate any traffic or construction activity other than maybe six weeks of construction during the, uh, 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 the construction process. Um, why do we need another cell site? I don't know that I need to sell it. I come to Conway quite frequently. I just finished uh, probably six months worth of hearings in um, Ashfield. Uh, we just filed an application in Buckland. Tom actually grew up in Ashfield and now lives in Conway. I actually sorry, Deerfield. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, uh, there, you know, I think you guys all know that there's a um, uh, a lack of reliable telecommunications, wireless telecommunications along the Route 116 corridor. And we've been very focused on that for several years now to finish the 116 corridor up going to 112 to connect up with the Route 2 corridor where there's already some decent telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, and the, the statistics are just staggering. Um, you know, over 50% of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts no longer has a landline. And that's, that is going up rapidly as we better deploy these telecommunications networks. Um, 70 percent, and that's an old statistic, it's over 75 percent now of 911 calls are made by mobile phones. And there's actually a mandate um, that telecommunications companies have to be able to pinpoint where a 911 call is coming from. So that when you dial 911, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I live in Rhode Island, and 10 years ago when you dialed 911, it would default to the Rhode Island dispatch, even though I would be sitting in Conway, Massachusetts. Now, when you dial 911, it goes to the Conway dispatch, but that just requires a better quality signal in Conway. And as you know, as you come up through the, the 116 corridor, there's just, um, um, and then certainly that long stretch in between the, what I would call downtown Conway, uh, where the water tank has some telecommunications antennas, and uh, going all the way through Ashfield, there's really no telecommunications facility. So that's what we're trying to do is, is improve it. And the only thing that has changed in the last two years since we were here the last time is um, people have started working from home more frequently, people are starting to try to educate from home more frequently, and uh, the, the need for telecommunications is getting more and more um, dramatic. Um, it's actually uh, becoming a safety hazard to not have better telecommunications. We do a lot of work with a lot of the regional planning commissions up in New Hampshire, and uh, we also do a lot of work with Franklin County improving the public safety networks but uh, 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 you know, there's a lot of uh, data out there to support that the lack of telecommunications, that people can't call 911 during an, uh, an automobile emergency or a fire, uh, uh, it, it just, it, it's, a, it's, it's a true problem. Uh, in addition, AT&T, um, who we do a lot of work with uh, throughout all the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, is building a dedicated public safety network um, called FirstNet, which is, uh, a network where um, um, in times of extreme needs, natural disasters, public safety is gonna have a dedicated communications network that uh, uh, they can deploy. And it really stems from really bigger um, um, public safety events like the Boston Marathon bombing, for example. Uh, everyone, call, everyone was calling their, uh, their people and their friends in Boston saying, are you okay? And public safety communications were suffering. Uh, so, as a result of that and other similar incidents, um, AT&T has partnered up with the federal government to develop this first net network, which requires them to go to rural areas like 
Conway, where the communications are lacking, but just as necessary as in more densely populated areas. Um, why here on Asheville Road? Um, I think you guys all know there's really not a lot of existing telecommunications infrastructure in Conway. As of right now, there's a water tank right here in the center of town that has some telecommunications antennas. Um, we permitted a facility on the Deerfield side of Conway, again along the 116 corridor that we're in the process of developing. Um, and then we just recently permitted a site in what I would call downtown Ashfield, right on the hill above Ashfield Lake. And, uh, um, and but uh, as you go along, you know that, that's a probably a, a seven or eight mile stretch between downtown Conway and downtown Ashfield uh, that just has um, no coverage. In addition, um, um, you know, so there's really no existing infrastructure. We provide a lot of data in the original application to support that. And the reason for this is the topography. Route 116 is, you know, basically snakes around all the hills, in the, you know, all the way from Deerfield, um, past through to Ashfield. And, uh, um, and the hills actually become a huge topographical impediment to telecommunications. I think you all experienced, and you heard it the last time, as you come up the hill from Deerfield, you know, that hill actually blocks the signal for the rest of Conway, which is why we permitted the site on the eastern side of Conway. And then the hills in between downtown and the Ashfield line, and the road kind of snakes uh, very dramatically. Um, you know, it uh, goes north and south. And those hills that, are, that the roads are curving around are actually huge topographical impediments to the telecommunications signal. So, um, and, and we provide immense amount of radio frequency data to show that you know, it's measurable, the gap, that you know, we can do software analysis um, to show where the existing coverage is. Um, and even if we superimpose, like I said, we just got a site approved in Ashfield that we're getting farther along in the development process. Um, and even if we superimpose that site on the prediction maps, there's still a, a, a tremendous gap along the 116 corridor right on the Ashfield um, uh, Conway line. Um, the site itself is a very large, I think it's 35 acre parcel um, that abuts Route uh, 116. There's an existing driveway on an adjacent parcel owned by the same landowner. So we'll be utilizing the existing driveway off of Route 116 um, and then coming across and then continuing up the hill to the top of the hill, curving around all the wetlands um, um, to get to the top of the hill. So that way we can provide the telecommunications signal both to the, uh, uh, I guess to the east going towards Conway Center and then towards the west going towards uh, South Ashfield. Uh, the, uh, um, the site was attractive to us because even though the access driveway is um, quite long, I think it's about 1,500 feet long, um, a, a good portion of it was already developed. So, um, and uh, there's an existing field at the bottom of the hill that we're able to cross. So, um, you know, even though the access driveway uh, uh, through the woods is, is um, as you notice, we walked, um, it was uh, steep in some places, and, you know, uh, in order to snake around the wetlands kind of longer than we like to build, it's still um, attractive because of the existing driveway that gets us about halfway there. Um, the facility itself is very, um, you know, the most of the construction, quite frankly, would be the driveway itself. The uh, facility itself is just a 60 by 60, um, what's that, 3,600 square feet uh, compound in the middle of the woods. Um, we, you know, the construction is maybe 75 by 75, uh, a little bit more than that. Um, Given the extensive slopes, there's also some erosion control features that our engineers have put on the plants to make sure that there's no off-site uh, stormwater runoff or any erosion. Um, the uh, um, inside the 60 by 60 is really just crushed stone with a couple of small um, foundations for telecommunications equipment and then a larger foundation for the tower. Uh, we haven't designed the foundation yet because what happens is we uh, uh, get through the permitting process and then our engineers go up there with geotechnical rigs to drill, drill down to do a more substantial uh, subsurface analysis to see what's under there. My suspicion is there'll be some ledge. And then they can design a foundation that's appropriate to the uh, facility and to the specific location. Um, the facility itself is what we call a monopole. It's just a single pole that uh, 
Um, all the cabling goes up through the middle of the pole, and at the top of the pole, we'll have platforms for different companies to attach telecommunications antennas. Um, I think by way of example, there's a similar facility uh, in Deerfield, right at the intersection of 116 and Route 5, uh, behind the Deerfield fire station. Uh, that is probably only about 100 to 120 feet. This will be a little bit taller because we have a, a, a more um, challenging topography to, uh, to get around. But uh, from a, 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 a look at standpoint, that's probably the uh, uh, um, most easily seen type of facility. There's also a similar facility in Ashfield off uh, Spruce Corner Road that uh, has been there for quite a while. But, uh, um, uh, so if you want to try to find that for the purposes of for comparisons. Uh, the, uh, um, um, the tower itself is 150 feet tall. Antennas get mounted on platforms. And uh, you'll notice through the data, um, you know, the, uh, we've shown the data at 145 feet. And that's because that's where the antennas are attached. So that they don't project up above the 150 foot tower. Um, in order to make sure that um, we, uh, uh, don't create any kind of lightning hazard. We put a lightning rod on the top. It's actually quite small. It's about the. Uh, it's, it's basically a piece of rebar that you, you won't see. It's about an inch thick and a, a six feet tall. That you really can't see it, but it's on the plans. So that's how we advertise it. Is the height will be 150 feet, 156 foot to the highest appurtenance, but it's really just a lightning rod. And quite frankly, um, uh, these these facilities actually attract lightning because they're always the tallest thing in the area. Um, and uh, um, so it's designed with a very extensive grounding system. When they design the foundation, they put very extensive grounding material underneath it. So it actually attracts lightning and, uh, and then dissipates it very safely throughout the ground to avoid having other structures like trees get struck by lightning. So we find that it's actually a much safer uh, uh, facility from a lightning perspective. Uh, the, uh, these, these facilities are also very safe. Um, they, um, we, you know, there's um, existing facilities in Ashfield and in Deerfield, and there's hundreds and thousands throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and tens of thousands similar facilities throughout the United States. And uh, um, they're very heavily regulated by the FCC. Um, and the reason is it's a two-way communication. Um, unlike AM radio, FM radio, which is designed to broadcast over a very large area, this is really designed to cover, and it's kind of amorphous, but a couple of square miles, really the 116 corridor, maybe a mile back, two miles back towards downtown at Conway, and then uh, going towards South Ashfield to connect up with our other Ashfield site. Um, and because it's a two-way communication, the, uh, the communication out of your cell phone is very low powered, so the reverse is very low powered. They routinely broadcast out at about 100 watts at, at full power which by way of comparison, WBZ in Boston, which is an AM station designed to broadcast throughout all of uh, eastern Massachusetts, and I bet you can get it on some of the hills here in Conway, uh, it broadcasts out of 50,000 watts. And it's just a whole different uh, technology. Um, and and uh, um, you know, we can do measurements to show that you know, these, the, the, they're very heavily regulated by the FCC with respect the power output and frequencies that are uh, deployed on the tower. And uh, you know, they really routinely come in at about 1%, oftentimes less than 1% of the uh, applicable FCC limits. Um, if there were uh, tall things in town, we would put them on it. And that would include churches, um, uh, residential buildings. Uh, there are actually two sets of antennas in the church that I go to every Sunday because it's the tallest building in the area. Um, 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 uh, uh, I did a project several years ago in the city of Worcester. All of the buildings, all, all the, the tallest structures in Worcester outside of downtown were all the Worcester Housing Authority buildings. So we put antennas on the Housing Authority buildings because one, the, the Housing Authority wanted food telecommunications, the city of Worcester wanted food telecommunications, but they were um, satisfied that the technology was very safe. I did a project where we put similar antennas on all of the veterans hospitals throughout all of New England because those tend to be taller buildings for their neighborhood. And we as an industry have utilized other uh, um, residential, commercial um, uh, structures uh, very successfully. 
Um, but in this particular case, there is one. But I just want you know people to know that this technology has existed for a very long time. This, uh, um, you know, uh, we've been, um, you know, it's the same technology that people developed with radios a hundred years ago. It's the same technology used by public safety for their two-way communications. It's just different frequencies on the uh, the radio frequency perspect uh, spectrum, uh, and it's just. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of data to support the, the safety for it. Um, uh, and, then we, um, and then what we've done is had our, our consultants show what this tower will cover um, um, in connection with the existing tower at, that we permit in Ashfield and the existing tower uh, at the, the water tank at the downtown um, Conway, right around the corner here. Um, and as you can see, it fills in the 116 corridor quite Carefully, it, it has some benefits going south, Poland Road, uh, uh, going south into Conway. It, uh, you know, we didn't try. It, you can see it doesn't really go very far to the north uh, because we're not really above the hills over there. We were really only focused on the 116 corridor, uh, and you know, we're not, you know, above the ridge behind us, which would have provided better coverage to the north. But uh, you know, it would have been a much taller and more intrusive uh, facility. Uh, uh, but like I said, back uh, a couple weeks ago, we put balloons up in the air. Uh, we engaged consultants to uh, go around and take pictures. And uh, um, I know uh, um, we also had the uh, planning board and zoning board site visit the, d the day when the balloon was up. And uh, uh, I, I submitted to the board, and I have tonight to show um, uh, different um, photos of the tower. And it's, um, you know, the, the visibility demonstration shows where the tower is visible, and more importantly, where it's not visible. And I think we, um, uh, I gotta applaud our, our real estate specialist. I think they picked a pretty good site. No tower is invisible. It's really hard to pick a spot that you're never gonna see it from anywhere, but uh, I think from this perspective, we, we did a pretty good job. Um, the, uh, um, um, the, and there's really not a whole lot of roads to the north, uh, Poland Road to the south, um, but they, they uh, visited several, um, uh, of the vantage points, you know, within a mile, because after a mile, the tower, even if you could see it, kind of dissipates into the horizon quite substantially. Um, and what this map shows um, is where they took pictures from. There was a little bit of visibility. Uh, red shows where there's no visibility, and we have pictures to support that. Yellow is where there's partial visibility, maybe through the trees, uh, um, and. Uh, um, but you know, uh, you know, which gets mitigated during the uh, um, uh, summer season when the leaves are on the trees, and uh, and then the green is where they took some photographs where there was some visibility, but we can show what it looks like with a photo simulation, and uh, um, uh, so and, and unfortunately, it doesn't make logical sense the way these photographs work because they they do it based on proximity to the tower, so they jump around a little bit. So I apologize if. Uh, it doesn't make sense uh, from a, 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 a logical perspective. But, you know, uh, photos one and two are uh, uh, from the uh, west side of the site, looking back towards, uh, um, um, towards the site, and there's no visibility whatsoever. Um, uh, is it, do you have the um, street, if you could just say, if you're going to do one? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, like I said, I've tried to get them to shuffle these and it's really hard because they do it based on distance from the site. Um, so I, I'll scroll through these, but uh, really the photographs that we want to look at are photo five, which is really the intersection of uh, Poland Road and the 116. And there was some visibility up on, I think it's Murray Road in Ashfield, but just over a mile away. The um, intersection of North Poland Road and 116. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. There, uh, there's one more green here. Uh, um, uh, is that is that what this is? North Poland Road to the mm -hmm. south yeah. of the site. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, so uh, so really, the photographs we're going to focus on are five, thirteen, twenty-one, and twenty-two. And the green is visibility year-round. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump to photograph five. Um, um, you can see, just see the balloon over the power lines right there, and uh, um, the tower will project up a little bit above the, um, 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 uh, the trees, but really not that visible. 
Um, I will tell you, while I was standing here, I talked to the property owner. I think she's actually here tonight. Uh, and uh, she actually said, and I quote, what a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, and the reason why she said that, because I'm not sure if it was her or her and her uh, husband are brother. firefighters. Brother. brother, I'm sorry, brother, are firefighters. And they uh, value the, uh, um, the, the better telecommunications. Can you um, zoom in on that? Just to point out, these are on the website, the Clinton Town website. So. Okay, the, oh, I don't know. The, the, oh, yeah, the, the tower oh. is right there. You see it? Um, <laughs> see, and, and what, what's this, what's this tree fills in? You're not going to see it. Um, um, but, you know, I think from uh, the intersection of Poland Road, you know, you, you, it's going to project above the tower. You're not going to see it from Route 116. You're going to see it if you're on North Poland Road by the entrance to... Uh, so, Fred, these are the artist simulations, not the balloons. Correct. Yeah, the, the balloon is... Um, So you can just see the balloon right there. Yep. Although I yeah. prefer to. And then, um, like I said, there was lot, there's lots of photographs in the package that showed no visibility. Um, 116. Um, uh, this is. Um, Asheville Gunner Town Line. That's correct. <laughs> just that, that just that over there. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other photograph that. Uh, that people were interested in North Poland Road. Uh, from halfway up North Poland Road, there was no visibility. But then uh, at the top of North Poland Road, where it takes the 90 degree turn, um, mm -hmm. and there's an open field on both sides, you can. Uh, um, Is there uh, paper sorry, copies no. here too, no. as well? Yeah. What's that? Are there paper copies of this? Package? Yes, I have them right here. Uh, okay, so if people want to take a look, there are paper copies. Yeah, th yeah, this is um, North Poland Road, kind of at the top of the hill where you take the 90 degree turn, and uh, the balloon is just in here. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, um, you see, the tower The tower is actually right in here. It doesn't project above the ridge, so all the, uh, the uh, and this was taken, you know, several weeks ago before the leaves started coming on the trees, so, um, uh, you know, and, and, and so this is where it's, really, it's not above the ridge line. The backdrop is going to uh, very uh, nicely meet the tower visibility. It's not above the ridge line. But, oh yeah, it's exactly. It's right in here. You see it? Great. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> see that when you zoom in. Well, that's Can a good zoom thing. In for us? Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. See it? It's just in there. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to jump to the last two photographs. Um, Like I said, this was taken on Murray Road, which is kind of a high point um, off of Hill Road, uh, coming off of Route 116. Um, and uh, I'm going to zoom in. The balloon was right in there. You really can't see the balloon on the photo because this is over a mile, and it's like about a mile and a third away. But uh, the simulation, yeah, you see the tower a little bit, but you can see how far it is in the distance. Um, uh, you know, like I said, uh, never built an invisible tower, but yeah, that's really the, I guess from my perspective, the best view of the tower. Um, and then farther down Murray Road, um, it, you can barely see it, but it's right in here, um, uh, and uh, it, it doesn't project up above the trees. But uh, it's, it's actually right there, uh, right underneath the cursor. And I'll zoom in. Um, you can see it right there. But you know, it almost looks like the. Uh, um, the extension of the, 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 the tree at that point. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, we've never built an invisible site, but uh, from a visibility perspective, um, um, I think, um, you know, quite frankly, this is uh, as good as we can do. Um, I'm sure you all read it. I produced a 25-page memorandum where I went through all of your zoning bylaw and said we... Uh, um, um, with the uh, one condition that we're requesting and one variance that we're requesting from the zoning board, um, we have complied with the bylaw um, 
Um, you know, I mean, um, and it's relatively easy in a town like Conway because there's really no alternative. There's nothing else that we could have looked at to design it. We meet all the uh, siting and design criteria that you uh, request with the exception of the fact that we are not a licensed carrier and request a condition and we need the height variance uh, to provide the requisite signal. Uh, uh, with respect to variances, uh, um, there's actually, most of the time, most of the towers that we build require a height variance of some sort. Um, uh, you know, back when people were developing telecommunications bylaws 20 years ago, um, they were trying to hide them. And now we actually want them because of the public safety benefit. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but there's an ample amount of case law throughout Massachusetts that just basically says the gap in coverage, the need for better telecommunications is the hardship that justifies the grant of a variance under Mass law. Uh, uh, and you know, as you guys know, the topography, the lack of telecommunications infrastructure, the, uh, um, um, the requirement to accommodate multiple telecommunications companies, the demand for the service, all justifies the uh, um, um, granting of the variance. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is that the, uh, the federal government is still very involved in wireless infrastructure uh, siting. Back about 20 years ago, I used to say 20 now, it's about 25 years, um, they um, adopted very comprehensive regulations. And it was all done as part of a, an effort to um, change the way we telecommunicate. Back um, when I was a lot younger, we had one phone company. And they broke up the phone company into multiple different regional companies. They um, licensed multiple different telecommunications companies in the wireless um, spectrum in order to encourage competition. And uh, uh, back when Tom and I first started this, there were seven different telecommunications companies providing service. Through mergers, there's now four. Uh, and there's always talk about more getting into telecommunications. It's always talk about Amazon or Google developing their own wireless networks to complement their particular services. But uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the government, in order to foster communications, foster competition among communications, is not yet a, 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 a comprehensive set of laws. A lot of um, jurisdiction defers to the FCC. It basically says that the FCC is deemed this technology safe. They, uh, um, you know, towns really can't get into discussions pertaining to the health effects of these particular types of facilities. Um, it doesn't, the, the, the Telecommunications Act doesn't say that you have to say yes. It just says you can't say no without sufficient reason. Uh, uh, and uh, there's been very few, if any case, in Massachusetts that have found sufficient reason. Uh, because, like I said, the, the government uh, wants to support wireless infrastructure. And billions of dollars are going into rural communities to better telecommunications uh, because they call it the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the wireless gap. Uh, uh, there's a huge, um, over the last 20 years, people have been focused on the major metropolitan areas. It's a lot easier to get Verizon to focus on Boston, where there's a million customers, versus Conway, which has equally needy customers, however, not as many. So that's why um, the government is trying to encourage with more investment and trying to uh, encourage folks like Vertex to go out and develop an infrastructure where it might not be economically viable for one particular company to come out here by themselves. Uh, and there's just an immense amount of case law throughout Massachusetts talking about the Telecommunications Act. Um, so I'm going to take a very deep breath and say we would respectfully request that the Planning Board grant the special permit um, um, with the one condition that we understand um, that uh, we will not build the facility without a licensed carrier. Uh, we would ask that the Zoning Board grant the height variance to permit the, the, the height of the structure and that, uh, um, and I, I don't know that we need any waivers. I think we gave everything that the town requires with respect to documentation and uh, um, site plan data. Uh, but uh, uh, we would respectfully request that the town approve it. Um, yeah, and the last thing I'll say is um, um, we're not done yet. Uh, these facilities, in addition to getting the benefits of federal um, encouragement, also have very extensive federal regulations. Uh, we have a very extensive um, uh, environmental due diligence process that we go through. And environmental is a very big word. It, uh, uh, it, we have to satisfy the 
uh, that we have no impact on Native American resources and endangered species and uh, 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 and uh, uh, historical. Uh, historical resources uh, and native uh, plant species as well as um, uh, wildlife. And in fact, um, we had done some. We do some plume analysis to make sure that we don't have any impact on those type of resources, so that we don't. Uh, and then we do more extensive research after we get through this process. However, but the Conservation Commission, by um, asking us to do some gravel work down at the bottom of the driveway, because we're in proximity of the riverfront, um, triggers one of those um, more extensive due diligence requirements. Now we have to do some filings with the EPA under what's called the NIPTES program to just make sure that we don't have any impact. And all we're doing is putting down some gravel on an existing driveway. So we're confident that we're not doing anything and actually reducing the risk that there is any impact. However, uh, you know, it's just um, these facilities get an immense amount of federal scrutiny as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so, like I said, once we get through the local permitting process through the planning board and the zoning board and the conservation commission, we still have uh, several months of engineering and other due diligence to complete. Uh, uh, so, with that, I would. Uh, um, uh, I have Tom Johnson here, the civil engineer. If you have any specific questions with respect to the site plan or the site, uh, and uh, um, hopefully I can answer whatever questions come up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everybody here and on the Zoom that we also have uh, hired an independent consultant. Mr. Parisi did refer to this mapping that they did about coverage, but we also have a report from an independent consultant who's here who can take questions as well. And we're going to. Um, and I apologize, I may have misspoken. I think it's probable that the photographic simulation package is not on the website yet, but it will be. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to the zoning board for any questions that they have. So um, actually, Beth, I wanted to ask you, do you envision us going through the process we're going to be going through now or to leave that till later? In the terms process? Of, OK. Um, well. <laughs> That, you know, well, it's a question of you. Of the statement. As, <laughs> as, opposed, question. as opposed to coming back to us afterwards. It, you know, uh, because we have things specific to the way variances have to be looked at. So, I mean, I could do that right now, actually, if I answer some of them. Um, can we get the Zoom back? Is that... Oh. He needs to stop, needs to stop sharing. sharing. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Um. One reason I asked that is because one of the zoning board members are, is on the zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I'm going to start. Andy, do you have any questions? Andy's muted. No. He said no? That's why. Okay. That was somebody named Anthony. That was Anthony. Andy left track. Andy left track. Yes. Is he still on there? Yeah. So, Andy, did you say you do not have questions? Andy's still muted. Andy's no, I don't have any questions. Okay. Okay, well, that's Anthony. That's Anthony. Well, we'll still oh, Andy. On, no, still not Andy Lechuk. <laughs> Is Andy still there? Yes. Yes. Sam, he can. Uh, I don't have any questions, although uh, I, it doesn't appear that Anthony does either. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you unanimous, I guess. Um, so I, have I do have some, but it's not directly related to, to zoning, but I'm assuming I can still answer. Yes, them. yes. Okay. So this is, Tom, this is a question for you as an engineer. So is this an is this in-house design that is designed by Vertex, or do you subcontract your design? No, um, my company is called Proterra Design Group. Okay, we're yeah, I saw you on the drawing. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're based okay. out of Hadley, but we're an independent engineer. Okay. And they're your, they're your third party design? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you, you have, do you have like ISO certifications and all the typical quality certifications um, for engineers? Mostly firms? it would be registered professional engineers. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're registered through the state of Massachusetts. Okay. Okay. I'm, go I'm going to interject here. When people speak, can you give your name? Because sure. For the, Sorry. For, for George taking minutes. Sure. And um, also, let's try to project as much as possible. Yes, we I apologize. Phyllis no, Crane, Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, another question that I have is if it's your design, you're, 
Vertex has design authority? No, uh, we engage independent engineers. Uh, they, uh, we can sell them. We, we develop lots of facilities, mm -hmm. but uh, and we kind of keep them as um, standard as possible. Mm -hmm. But the engineers really have design authority too, because they're stamping them. Right. Yeah, we consider Vertex to be is a client and the project owner. Okay. Um, but we're an independent <coughs> engineer firm. So, and you have you have design authority. Yes. Okay. So you have responsibility for the adequacy of the design. Yeah, that's yep. By stamping and certifying the plans. That's okay. Fine. Okay. And then, so for these types of projects, would the town have a permanent point of contact as a point of governance during the construction process as well as after the after the facility is built? Yes. Um, Vertex will own the tower. Mm -hmm. We can provide that information to the town. Um, there'll be a sign on the, uh, the gate that says, in case of issues, call us with an 800 uh, um, 24 hour seven um, uh, network operating center that will uh, um, be responsive to whatever issues come. And if there, if there was some issue with the facility and the town needed to meet with Vertex within 24, 48 hours, that would yes. be possible because Absolutely. we would have all of those points of contact? Actually, yes. Okay. Okay. And given that the foundation has not been designed because you're doing additional engineering studies for the site, <laughs> do you anticipate there could be blasting? So there's, um, there's, there's a good amount of ledge on this side. Um, okay. The, the, the foundation for a tower is typically 25 to 30 feet square and it's set in the ground mm -hmm. about six feet and then it's buried. Um, so there's a, there's a chance that we could run into some ledge. Um, generally, we try to hammer the ledge first and um, in some cases we've blasted. That's kind of our last option. So assuming that there was ledge, and this is really a governance question again, would you would notify? Would you notify the town and the abutters that there was blasting? And yeah, there's okay. a there's a process through the blaster usually manages that. There's a blasting plan that gets put together. Okay. I think they consult with the fire department, and I think there's a they usually do a pre and post blast survey. Okay. And um, we're a good distance away from any road or house or structure, generally where you know there's potentials for issues if you're on the side of a road or if you're mm -hmm. near a an old foundation or something like that. Well, there is a camp. There is a camp nearby. So that was really the source of my question, mm -hmm. that if there was some need, to, some need to blast, that there would be notification to the town and that camp if it was active at that particular, at that the particular camp, time. The camp will not be active at that time. We've already, I'm the landowner. Ah, oh, okay. And we've already discussed with Vertex and they have agreed not to do any construction like that or heavy construction while the camp is operating okay. during the summer. Okay, great, thank you. And, yeah. and just a little bit more about the blasting process. It's, um, they drill a whole series of holes to the depth. Mm -hmm. It's all matted. It's not, um, right. it's not you don't see the movies with the blasting. <laughs> right. It's, right. Uh, it's right. all just muted and, and controlled. So. Right, and is the blasting firm your subcontractor? It would be a general contractor that would be hired for the job, and it would be a subcontractor for the, for the general contractor. And who hires that party? Vertex or Vertex or hires the general contractor. You hire, you hire the general contractor? Yeah. And you would hire the blasting firm? The, blast. the, the general contractor would hire the General blast. contractor hires them. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a specialty thing. It's a blaster. Right. They, they, that's what they do. I'm just trying to understand for the, for the, for the complexities of this project. Who is who's who, who is who's supplier, and who contracts who contracts with who yep. for the various aspects of the it. The other thing I think relevant to your question, um, we engage engineers to supervise the project. Okay. And yeah. so supervise the construction. Right. So because they've done very extensive drawings, and right. we don't want the general contractor to just be doing whatever they want. So the engineers are on site. Uh, monitoring the construction activity to make sure it complies with the plans. Right. And, and if there were any conditions imposed, like we've already agreed with the landowner, uh, no building during the summertime. Okay. However, if the town ever imposed conditions like that, they'd be put on the plans and the engineers would be responsible for making sure that that 
was complied with. Okay, so and you probably have a project manager at Vertex that interacts with the engineering firm. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, just just to expand on on that a little bit, it's a question that came up with the pre meetings of the planning board. There's a process through the building permit mm -hmm. um, where where Vertex applies for a building permit, and it's it's called a um, construction control where it's a Mm -hmm. The engineers provide an affidavit that say we will be involved throughout the <coughs> course of construction. We'll be here to monitor, provide periodic reports, and um, if there's any deficiencies along the way, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make sure they're rectified. And then the, my final question is, so the, the materials that you use to construct the facility, are they sourced globally? Um, you say globally? It, it, globally. Are they sourced globally, the, the metals and the materials? The... the um, that's a good question. The um, typically the the tower manufacturers are um, from the Midwest. There's one from New York. There's one from uh, Texas. There's one from uh, somewhere out in okay. Indiana. Okay. You know why I'm asking the question? Supply chain issues, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I will tell you. Um, I know we were in front of the zoning board a couple weeks ago and the planning board. Uh, we permitted a site in um, Conway about two years ago. And I have all our permits in place, so I'm done with the town of Conway, with the exception of pulling a building permit. However, because of supply chain issues, mainly the not so much the uh, the, the tower itself, it just takes us longer. Mm -hmm. But the electronics themselves right. are a real challenge. So right. getting the commitment from Verizon, uh, a lot of telecommunication companies have slowed down their. Um, developments because of their own supply chain issues. So okay. we're struggling, which is why we haven't finished the site in uh, on the eastern side of Conway. So is there any risk that the tower would only be partially built because of issues like that? No, because one of the conditions that the planning board imposed on us is that we don't build it without a um, licensed carrier. Under contract? So, under contract, Under exactly. contract. And how uh, long are those contracts typically? Um, any, it's not anyway 20, 25 years. Oh, long gotcha. Time. Okay. That, those are all my questions. Thank you. Are there other zoning board? Well, I, actually, I, I, I want to know about uh, five. I, this might have been buried in your um, application. How, is this for 4G or 5G as well? Um, the short answer is it's going to be for telecommunications. And what the 5G and 4G stands for are the generation of technology. Um, it, it started off with you know, analog phones and then digital phones and then uh, higher bandwidth 4G and now 5G is just a, 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 a kind of a marketing term, kind of a scientific term that's talking about the fifth generation of technology. It's uh, more frequencies, more um, uh, higher data speeds uh, and uh, I'd almost ask you to wait, I think you could ask, the, the, Towns engage their consultant. Uh, 5G is coming. It's uh, uh, it's going to be a while before it comes to Conway, Mass. Quite frankly, because they're just starting to deploy it in places like Boston and Dallas and New York, and uh, even and notwithstanding all of the big marketing um, things that you see on TV, um, it's uh, it's going to be a while before 5G comes to rural America. But one reason I ask that is because the what's reported is they're far. They're smaller, but many more towers. Is my understanding is if that's at all correct? Would is that correct? Um, the, I'll, I'll preface it by saying, if it is correct, then would this tower become obsolete once that comes in? Um, it will never become obsolete. What's happening in places like Boston, where there were a lot of tall buildings and several towers built, um, and they were a mile apart, and then maybe a half a mile apart. And now they're deploying sites to supplement those on every telephone pole in Boston. Uh, it's, uh, and the macro sites, we call them, the original sites that were designed to uh, broadcast over a greater area, aren't going away. It's just they're using smaller sites to supplement them. Uh. So it, that's the reason I asked about the, the protocols here is um, in granting a variance, there are seven criteria. You address some of them. So I'll just read through them, and, and some of them clearly have already addressed. One is that the, the structure named in the variance is uniquely and specifically impacted by the soil and the shape of the land um, that prevents it from being uh, complying with the zoning. 
and I guess for this it's really just zeroed in at the height of it that you're asking for well, variance. Um, um, there's one more word that you missed, is that's topography. Topography, yes. And that's the relevant word. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the topography is such relative to the area that um, we need to get the height to get above the topography. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, so uh, and and the and also the terrain. We, um, um, I think Ashfield and Buckland, they had it based on the height of the trees. You can only be 10 feet above the trees, which just doesn't make sense because, uh, you know, in a flat world, that might work. But, you know, 10 feet above the trees, you know, on the side of the hill means the trees are taller up the hill. So we've got to be above all of that. And so, um, and in this particular case, because there's really not a lot of roads to the north, uh, it's really the 116 corridor in our world. Um, uh, you know, Asheville was different because we were trying to cover the 112 corridor, the 116 corridor, and what I would call downtown Asheville, coming all the way uh, into South Asheville. Uh, this is really just a linear site to design for the 116 corridor. But as you can imagine, uh, you know, there's three very substantial hills in between this site and where we are right now. And, uh, and similarly, going towards Asheville Center, there are two very substantial hills, and so we're trying to get above those. So. That's the uh, uh, the need for the additional height. Okay. And topography in that case also gives exactly. altitude in that case. Um, the second one is that the circumstances do not generally affect land or other structures in the zoning district. Um, I think you, you answered that in terms of the fact that there's very little there. Um, that there's uh, the sec the third one is that due to circumstances related to the soil shape or topography, the petitioner would suffer hardship and actually, if the zoning is enforced, in this case, not the petitioner as much as the customers, I would expect. Well, it, it's both. Um, we're the infrastructure developer. One of the things that we're trying to do is build a structure that accommodates multiple telecommunications companies. So, uh, um, um, and, and these are kind of like vertical totem poles. Uh, instead of horizontal real estate, it's vertical real estate. And different companies lease at different heights. So we need to make sure that the lowest height on the totem pole it's just as, um, <coughs> covers just as well as the tire site. So it, we're really, it's really our variance that we're asking for, for that purpose. Um, the fourth one has to do with um, financial or another hardship that not be, may not be personal for the petitioner, but affect other properties in the district and must relate still to the soil shape and topography. Um, how would you answer that? Um, we're limited in where we can go based on where the existing water tank is and where we've already permitted a site in um, Asheville. So we don't have the latitude to say, let's go three hills over or three hills west. Uh, and so um, the, um, the, the hardship is created by where the gap is and the lack of alternatives. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we're up. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's not financial. We can't go anyplace else, and uh, uh, and it's not like I can go into Ashfield and build a 180 foot tower that covers all of of, of of Conway as well, or anything like that, because we're limited by the the technology and the power of it. So, uh, meaning the range, the, exactly. Uh, and so, uh, so we're we're very limited with where we can go, uh, and, and so that and that creates the hardship. Um, the fifth one out of seven is granting the variance would not cause detriment to public good or actually may even enhance it. Right. We uh, maintain that uh, the uh, enhanced telecommunications, good for people, good for businesses, good for travelers, uh, and certainly good for public safety. So it's certainly a public benefit. And the sixth one is um, that granting the variance would not nullify or degrade substantially <laughs> the meaning and the intent of the zoning bylaws. And, and that was the whole point of the visibility demonstration. Um, it's, um, everyone thinks that by building something 150 feet tall, it's going to be, you're going to see 150 feet from every direction. And, uh, and so, and I think that was the intent of yours and everyone else's zoning bylaw to limit the height. But as we found, one, we need the height, and two, you know, going above the variant, the limit imposed by the town um, doesn't create a, a, a detriment because you really can't see it. Uh, yeah, you can see it from a mile away, but it um, it doesn't substantially derogate from the public good. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to quote from the, the zoning bylaws for Conway. 
uh, D number four. It said new towers shall be the minimum height necessary to comply with the purpose of the bylaw and not exceed 120 feet. So you're saying to, to comply with it, it needs to be right. higher. Uh, yeah, and it, uh, it doesn't say the maximum height, it says the minimum, minimum. height. Uh, and so, you know, we're trying to design thoughtful infrastructure. Um, uh, what used to happen uh, when we first started here is uh, AT&T would build a tower and uh, then Verizon would show up and say, can we go on your tower, AT&T? And they'd say no, because they, they were competing against each other. And so companies like Vertex have come in to develop infrastructure. We, we have a relationship with everybody. We share with everybody. We have contracts with everybody. And, uh, uh, so, but we've got to design something that accommodates everybody. And now that's like the minimum height necessary to accommodate multiple telecommunications companies so that we don't have right. multiple companies saying, I, I need one right next to the other. Right, so the bylaw says it will not exceed 120 feet, but if it, um, but the, the minimum height you're saying right. must, must exceed that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, let's see, the, and the, the last one is the owner cannot make, it needs a variance, but <coughs> cannot make reasonable use of the property under the existing zoning. In this case, it's not the owner, but right. the, the lease arrangement you have with that. Correct. Okay. Great. Yes. Do you have any, any other questions from the zoning board? I don't think so. Nope. Andy said he did not, and Anthony didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Peter, now Peter we're going to open it up to questions <laughs> from <laughs> the planning board. Um, I actually have a question about supplement number three that you referred to, which I don't remember. I have right here. Received. Oh. And we just got it today. Did that come today? Yes. Okay. That's what I emailed you today. Mm -hmm. I know. I I I I cannot say I had time to do it. No, if it came today, we did not have time to review it. And and I'm going to tell you, um, it's one site plan that shows us doing the small improvements to the driveway at the bottom of the driveway. Okay. Uh, and it's basically we're throwing down some gravel. We're not taking down any trees or changing the driveway. Right. It was really done for the benefit of the Conservation Commission, but I have several copies here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, then, and then, I don't know if it was you or the Conservation Commission asked for a road maintenance plan, and we submitted That was the Conservation right. Commission, because exactly. it was not us. Right. So, were those, uh, so while this is being passed out, I'm just going to remember, I'm just going to remind everyone who's on the Zoom that you do need to sign in in the chat and close everyone in the room if you came in afterwards. And I emailed it to um, Mark. So there is no, somebody on the, there's at least one that. person on the you phone, uh, so uh, we'll uh, have so to figure out. Right. So, multiple hats. multiple So, Fran, so just with regard to this um, document that you provided to us on page, uh, well, it says it's page two, but it actually is probably page two. But um, it, it has construction management, contractor, address, phone number. That's all things that will be filled in at the time that you end up finding exactly. the Exactly, we contract. haven't hired a contractor. Right. Exactly. But these are the obligations that that contractor is going to assume. Correct. Okay, got it. Oh, I see. And, and it's also okay. the, um, the owner going forward. It's a maintenance plan for the owner to right. follow, and it gives instructions on how each one of the stormwater features will be maintained in the future, and the, the regularity with which it should be inspected and maintained. So it's a it's an outline plan for the, the length of uh, lifespan of the, of the facility. And who is going to be responsible for maintaining the driveway after the construction is completed? That's um, Vertex as the owner. Vertex as the owner. Okay. Yeah. And that's I wasn't sure the, because you're leasing the property. Are you not from? Yep, from the leasing landowner? the property, but then also leasing um, rights to maintain the driveway and the drainage okay. structures. Okay. Right. I just wanted to be clear on who yes. the owner. Of the and while we're talking about paper, I have I only printed out one copy of the. Uh, uh, Photo simulation. I mean, one plan board, one design board, and I emailed that in a couple That's days fine. ago. That's so, uh, of the photo simulation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. It's just it's a lot of paper, and a lot of color, and a lot of ink, and a lot yeah, of trees. Yeah, yeah. We can pass that around the room if people want and to Beth, see it. And Beth, you said you're going to have that on the on the website. Yes, yes, yes. It will be on the website. Um, we why don't we pass this around the room so people can take a look at it? Who are here? I apologize to people on Zoom. You, you can't pass it to you. Um, uh, okay, that was my question, the driveway question. So I have a question, Fran. Yep. Um, should the special permit be granted 
and uh, you run into potential expiration based on supply chain matters, which is sort of what's happening with the current yeah. tower that's been permitted. What is your plan for going forward in, uh, in the event of expiration? I believe that Mass Law gives us two years to commence construction. Yeah. And, uh, um, and we came to the planning board and the zoning board to extend that. Okay. Uh, I don't think that we will need that going forward with this site, but I didn't know two years ago that we sure. were going to have a pandemic <laughs> and, uh, and have supply chain issues, but uh, we will comply with Mass Law and seek extension of the Okay, thank you. Fran, I had another question. You mentioned the um, tower at the corner of 116 and Route 5. Is that your tower or is that that's somebody no, else's I, tower? I, I don't know who it's owned by. It might be owned by the town of Deerfield. It's okay. just from a, a design perspective, it's very similar. Okay, thank you. It's the one in the fire. The fire it's, it's right behind. Yeah. It's right. If you come off of 116 and you're yeah. sitting at the intersection, it, fire station right there, it's right behind. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that's always been there, so you don't just don't know. Know. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and there's actually another one. Tom, help me out. There's another one in Deerfield up on the hill. You see it because it's, it's way above the ridge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's behind Eagle Brook School, but that's a... Oh, yeah, I've walked past that. Yeah. That's a lattice-type structure. The one in the center of Deerfield is a monofilm, which is um, this Mono. type of job. Monofilm. Monofilm. Mono. Mono. <laughs> Joe, did you have any questions? I'm good, right? George, do you have any questions? Or Bill? Or Bill? Or uh, no, not, not at this point. I just want to remind everyone in the real world to identify themselves clearly and distinctly oh, for those of us uh, in, in Zoom world. Thank oh, thank you, George. Sorry. If I might just add, um, George asked a question during the, the initial <coughs> consult meetings, and, and it had to do with this um, long-term maintenance of the driveway and the stormwater. Yes. I'm not sure if he's had a chance to see it yet, but um, I think that part of this middle that conservation also asked for uh, addresses some of those questions that George raised previously. Supplement three, which you're talking exactly. about. Yes. Yeah. Long term stormwater pollution prevention plan and operation and maintenance plan <laughs> and site plan, site plan supplement sheet A4, driveway resurfacing plans. Okay. I feel that we were lumped in together with some other um, developers in town that weren't as diligent as we are. And, I don't say um, you're not lumped <coughs> in, but you know, no, experience is an important. Uh, I, I think you know, I, I provided the planning board with a bunch of references. We just finished construction in Coleraine. We just finished construction in um, Shootsbury. Yes. Uh, we built a tower in um, Monterey, um, several up in New Hampshire, uh, not that far from here. Yeah. Um, we've got a very stellar reputation. Yes, we did speak to some of the people you referred us to, and they were they were complimentary towards you for sure. But they also pointed out that this wasn't as steep; uh, their sites weren't as steep, and the wetlands weren't involved. So, um, Shootsbury, you're right. Um, Monterey was very steep. I don't think we talked. Um, uh, and I don't think we Coloring, spoke to Monterey. I think Coloring, we spoke to Coloring uh, and Shootsbury. Coloring didn't have wetlands, but it did have. Yeah, there were some wetlands in Coloring. It was the sections which were <coughs> kind of steep, but then there were a few. Um, okay. The whole road wasn't steep. But. So, in, we, in addition to our engineers, we engaged wetlands biologists to what and survey the site. <coughs> uh, this was obvious because there's also maps that we can obtain. Um, through your and the state GIS systems to kind of uh, alert us to wetlands. Our engineers and our real estate people are very uh, cognizant about wetlands because we run into them. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, but we engage biologists to go out and uh, 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 survey it very carefully. Thank you. Yeah, do we, uh, we're just, uh, Reminding ourselves about the decommissioning bond, which we... Yeah, in the original package, we produced an estimate and a bond. Um, it's a routine request, and uh, um, we would... So we provide an estimate of what it will take to take down, um, and then we would supply the final bond when we pull a building permit. Okay, okay. Yeah, of course, about the landscape plan. Yeah, great. And have you discussed the landscape plan with the owner? Um, other than the additional gravel work being done 
uh, at the request of the Conservation Commission, we're not planting anything. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the opposite, cutting, cutting the trees down. Um, we've walked the site the several times with the landowner. Um, uh, she's very familiar with the land. Uh, she uh, um, beat us all up the hill the last time we went there. And we're very conscious there's um, kind of sort of an existing cart path that we're kind of sort of following. The problem is, is that the cart path was built before the Wetlands Protection Act, and so we had to kind of use it and then go around it because of the wetlands. But that that landlord is very aware of where we're going. Anything you specifically about? <coughs> I assume she has no plans to cut the trees down. No, it's operated as a uh, wilderness camp, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What I'm referring to on the last one. We, we put a zone around the tower, I think it was 150 feet, so that trees would not be deliberately taken down and therefore expose the, more of the monoball. And I'm sort of asking that same question here. Um, we, I've not spoken to her specifically about that. Um, we can talk about that. I don't know what her plans are, so I, uh, uh, and only only because there's existing activity. I can't. I I, I understand the question, and <coughs> um, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, oh. I'm the landowner, and yeah. I have no but can plans. Can you state your name, Bobby? Uh, please, can you? State Barbara please. Belleville, and I'm the landowner, and I have no plans to uh, do any cutting down of trees. And the camp that's there is a wilderness survival and education camp. Okay, if members of the planning board and those on the planning board on the Zoom have no further questions right now, I'm going to open it. Uh, their questions are going to go in the order I mentioned before, which would be if anyone is here from the select board, and I see someone right there, Bob Armstrong, if you have any questions, feel free to. I don't have any questions as a select board member because really the select board has relatively no role in this process, but can I ask another question or a comment? And, and so, so we went through all of this, and you mentioned two years ago, but it was more than two years ago that you originally came to the Zoning Board of Appeals and did this exact same process. It was in February of 2020. Was it in 20? Yes. It felt like longer ago before the yeah. pandemic to me. <laughs> well, that was just the time. Time, yeah. flies time, time flies. So, I know it was before the pandemic. And, and, uh, but in that hearing and in this hearing, what stands out to me so strongly is the incredibly low power of the antennas that are at the top of this antenna, mm -hmm. let alone how much, how strong they will be by the time they get, you know, very far away from the antenna. Um, so, the, I mean, a 100-watt signal, you know, one 100-watt light bulb, if you think about what that power is. You know, these antennas are, you know, very low power. These are not trying to cast a signal very far. So, to me, that made me feel very comfortable about the one that's down on Route 116 that's really looking right down on Walter's house, level, you know, more than anything. Um, and, and anyway, so... That, that, that was important to me. The other thing is, I did hike up this to the site with Bruton as a Conservation Commission member, and, 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 and all of us, yes, and, and I would not characterize the location of this tower as being nearby the camp. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's a serious hike, you know, uh, and, uh, they, you know, it, it took us a long time to hike from the camp <coughs> up to where the tower is located. Um, and then it does have an incredible line of sight view down the Route 116 corridor. I mean, it's, it's a great location, um, but it's not nearby, near, uh, somebody used that word, you know, it is not nearby anything. Um, <coughs> So the, the, those are really my two comments. Oh, oh, one more as a conservation commission. So two weeks from today, we're going to have a conservation commission meeting here to talk about what, what we saw when we hiked up there. So I'm not 
really I, here to talk about that. But in general, the Conservation Commission almost always finds some orders and conditions to apply to the construction site that deal with erosion. And, and so although they've done a great job of avoiding the wetlands, um, the road that they will have to construct to get up to the tower site at some points is uphill from wetlands that are far below it, but these are steep grades, and, and, and I'm sure that the Conservation Commission will be looking at various erosion measures like that, even though we're a good long distance away from the wetlands. But, uh. Thank you, Bob. Speaking as the light board yourself and Conservation <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you. So um, I'm going to move on uh, to the, and recognize the fire, if fire would like to speak. Um, yes, I would. Uh, I'm Robert Baker, the fire chief. <clears throat> in the past few years in Conway, or anywhere in Franklin County, I mean, actually the whole state, the great wisdom of our state police have decided to, who controls our dispatch centers, where we get our signals on these little black boxes to tell us we have a call, emergency call, um, have upgraded from 400 megahertz to 800 megahertz which has given us actually almost less service because the state police are in the process of putting up towers of their own. They started out in the New York border and are working east. Well, they haven't got into this area yet, but they're working it. So what we've had to done to, to offset this so we have coverage for our first responders is we had to go to a cell phone service. And it's called I Am Responding, and it's out over our cell phones. So when we get a call, it's automatically sent out through our black boxes, and it automatically sends out through our cell phone if we have cell phone service, and your little cell phone starts going nuts. And it, goes, <laughs> and it, and it lays the whole call right up for you. And the nice thing about it is, is, especially with me, the head of my department, the person that receives it on their cell phone, they just tap a button, they go into the system, and they, sell it. they say, I'm responding, or I'm not responding, or I'm unavailable, or I'm responding to the station. And I can call, if we, I live right in the center of town, I get up to the fire station, I wonder if I got a crew coming, or don't I got a crew coming, I can look on my phone, and I can see everybody is doing what everybody's going else is going to do. But it takes the cell phone signal to do that. And anything you people can do to help improve the cell phone service in Conway would be a tremendous wonder to us. Because we think, and we, uh, Fire Chiefs Association and everybody have kind of discussed this in our past, and we kind of think that eventually all the signaling is going to be done through your cell phone service. These pages will go away. Matter of fact, that since they've gone to the 800 from the 400 megahertz, to the 800, our existing pagers, these little black box things here, are 400 megahertz. Are 400 megahertz. And they have just developed the first 800 megahertz pager, which is coming out this year. Uh, and so we're kind of running on a dual band system right now, the state police are. They're transmitting on their 800 frequency and they're also transmitting on 400 frequency so the firefighters and the EMTs can get their calls. So I think that you know anything that can be done to improve the cell phone service and this 116 quarter, I can tell you many times I've been out on calls from Conway Center to Burnett's Sugar House or just even around the corner from Burnett's Sugar House to the town line where we've had automobile accidents, we've had camper fires, we've had car crashes and the reception out there for the radio communication is very, very poor because of the windiness in the hills. We've had tornadoes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tornadoes. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. anything they could do to help us, uh, we would be really, really appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Bob. Um, is there anybody on the, I forgot to ask this, is there anybody on the Zoom call who is um, um, a town department person? Committee member, thank you. Just put that in the chat and Joe will find you. Um, 
Is there anyone here from the um, highway department who wants to speak to this? Or the police department who wants to speak to this? I don't see anybody. Uh, Board of Health who wants to speak to this? They're not here. Okay, thank you. Assessors. Assessors. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Lee Wickham. Lee Wickham from the Assessor's Office. Uh, just as a point of interest, this will be bringing extra tax revenue to the community. The land under the facility will be taxed at, uh, at, at basically at an industrial rate, I believe, based on the fact that it is generating income. And each of the companies that subscribe to put antennas on it will also be paying taxes on their personal property. So there'll be increased tax on the real estate, plus tax on the tower itself, and the antennas on the tower. I don't have any figures yet, of course, but people always ask that question. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Sure. Um, it, uh, I cover that? Okay. Is there anybody on the Zoom? No. Speak on that? Okay, so um, if there are abutters to the property who want to speak, um, we were ready to call on you. Um, I actually have a letter to read into the record from Bill Burnett, which we received um, in the planning board mail. Um, and I will provide this to you, George, so you don't have to write this down. Um, I'm Bill Burnett and will be out of state on the night of the public hearing about the cell tower uh, on Asheville Road. I am a partner with my sister, Deborah Craven of Burnett Farm at 42 North Colon Road, abutting the property of the proposed cell tower. Our family has lived here and worked the farm since forever, really. <laughs> 1781. Our property will be the most visually impacted by this tower, as anyone in this town, as the pictures will show. We are 100% in favor of this cell tower. The safety of having cell service is critical for this area. I've been a member of the Asheville Fire Department for over 40 years and the Conway Fire Department for over 20 years. I remember coming upon a bicyclist down on Route 116. Ironically, the victim was from the student hustling program, which is the location of the star. I, I had to drive to find someone home to call for an ambulance. If we had cell service, there would not have been a delay in the response of EMS. Yeah. I strongly urge the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals to approve this critical cell tower for the safety of the citizens of this town and surrounding towns. Also, I would ask the Board to request from Vertex to install emergency services transmitters on the tower as the reception in the Poland and Williamsburg Road area of town are difficult. Thank you, Bill Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Burnett, for taking the time to write that. Yeah, do we want to, re do we want to address that right now, the requirement? Yeah about the EMS things. We can talk about it in a minute. We'll move back to that EMS piece. Um, are there other are there other butters present who want to speak? Yeah. Or ask a question? Are you in a butter of the property? Uh, Walter Goodridge, I'm in a butter of the South Deerfield Road property. Right. But but are not we talking about two different yes. properties? Yes. Yes. We're talking about the property on one sixteen. One sixteen. Where's Asheville? Well, the far, farther away from the, the Asheville town the line. Asheville town line, not the Deerfield town line. And so you can speak in a moment, but first we're going to hear from the abutters from this property. Okay. Is there anybody here? Yeah, I'm, I'm a butter plus one. Okay. Throw in a couple of hundred feet of woods there. And well, then we're talking about butter. immediate abutters. Lee Whitcomb, um, Asheville Road again. Okay. And uh, I agree completely with Bill's letter. The, uh, the problem with emergency services came to hit me quite personally several years ago. I was coming home one evening through Ashfield, and as I got to the lower level of South Ashfield, my house is, is right there, obviously, uh, it became glare ice. Absolutely glare ice. You couldn't drive, and I started very slowly around the corner and just kept going and up the banking. And although I was not seriously hurt, the car was totaled. And sticking out into the road in the night, in the dark, and of course I could not make a phone call. This is a half mile west of the town line. It was impossible to make a call. It was very difficult to walk home, and at that time of night, nobody's driving on 116 either. 
So had I been injured, it could have been a very, very serious situation. If my husband's working out in the woods and hurts himself, without a cell phone to call, it could be a desperate situation. This tower has the capability of reaching, I think, close to six dozen homes, Conway homes, between 116, <coughs> North Poland, Main Poland, South Ashfield Roads, in addition to the Ashfield, South Ashfield Village homes that it might pick up and others closer to Conway. So I feel that that is a, a serious consideration for everyone to take in, into place. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other, I want to um, actually interject here that um, the consultant, Brett Goldstein of Interro Consulting, I did ask him as part of the uh, report he prepared for us, um, if he could take an estimate of how many homes would be um, covered by this proposed tower. And so if he's still here, yes. uh, I'm wondering if he could um, just speak to that for a moment. Fred, are you here? Are yes, I'm here. Okay, hi. Hey. We'll just keep the camera off when I'm not uh, talking. <laughs> yeah. And I, I did um, actually do a count of, of houses. And uh, just give me a minute to, to bring it up. I think I had sent it in an email. But here we are, um, Conway. Um, Conway Houses. Here's my spreadsheet, and I had a list of all of the houses in Conway and whether they would be covered. And um, that's not the one that has the. Huh? Well, we can give you a minute to find it and then. We can come There's back to that. Total, yeah, I, I did have a total number of, um, let me see if this is a spreadsheet that has it. Otherwise, it was in an email. Um, yeah. Well, I had the total, so let me just find that. Um, mm -hmm. do, 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 do. Yeah. Email, we can come back to you in a minute. Sure. Let's come back to you in uh, about five minutes. I think there's sure, other. Sure. Yeah. Let's we'll do there... just pull the numbers. Okay. Great. Are there are there other abutters who wanted to speak directly? Yeah. Hi. My name is Henry Horseman. Most people know me as Hank. I came home the other day when the, the balloon was up there, and uh, I was sort of happy to see it. To be honest with you. I was coming up the driveway and I happened to look over to the left and there it was. And uh, I don't have any problem at all with this. As far as I'm concerned, this is progress. Uh, I love that it's going to help the, the, the fire department uh, and anybody. I came home one time and there was a, there was a motorcycle accident short way from my driveway and uh, Guy's laying out in the road. He was uh, out of it then, and we couldn't do anything. Everybody had cell phones. None of them worked. Uh, so everybody had to run down to the nearest house to get the person help. I mean, all this takes time. Who knows if this person has a family, kids, whatever. It's a shame to take time when you can when you can instantly do something. And it's it's a small it's a small price to pay. It's it's if you want to complain about looking at things, how about uh, dishes on every house? You know, I think they're about the ugliest things in the world. I'd, I'd much rather look at a TV antenna. Probably some people don't even know what they are. Uh, yeah, I'm old. Uh, it's I have I have no problem at all with this. Uh, the only question I have is it Frank? Frank. Frank. Frank? Yes. Uh, you don't maintain that road during the winter? Not generally. Nothing really happens in the winter time. And uh, 
Um, if someone <laughs> needed to go up there, um, they bring us uh, like a four wheel drive or a snowmobile device. Uh, it would be rare that we, if, if there was kind of like emergency construction, we'd have to plow it, but I would say that's rarely. It's exactly not the norm, in other words. Exactly. Okay. That was my only other question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horston. It's, uh, yeah, hi. Hi, my name's Deb Craven. I live on 14 on phone road. I agree with my brother's letter. Um, my other question is, is there a chance that, you know, fire antennas will be put on this fire, EMS, police, whatever, because it'll help a lot. Um, we had a situation after the tornado, the second time the power went out. I, the first time, we lost a, a, a circuit board in my mom's pellet stove, so. That next morning, or that Thursday morning at the power went out, I'm unplugging stuff. I had uh, satellite TV at the time. There's smoke coming between my TV and my satellite dish. I unplugged it, it stopped. Thank God, because I had no phone. I was gonna have to drive to Eldridge Road to make a phone call. And my mom was at, she was living with me at the time, she had broken a leg. So it was, you know, a case of luckily it stopped smoking. And, but it was, yeah, it's an interesting situation not having, you know, service. I have a question for Bob. Are you going to really need fire antennas if you're going to go to cell phone? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I can't answer that at this point, Joe. Like I said, the state police are, are, are moving east with their towers. Where they choose to put them, I don't know. I think right now they're only putting them on state towers. I think eventually when they get to look at the whole picture to try to get the largest amount of coverage they can get, they may have to go to some smaller towers, similar to this one, and put an antenna on. That would be my guess. Do you want to speak to the emergency yeah. services piece um, of this? Similar to the last application, the board imposed a condition that we provide space on the tower for their reasonable requirements. And the answer is unequivocally yes. So we have a, a similar, I, yeah. I would assume Part that the board the would impose a similar condition and we would agree to that. It, uh, quite frankly, it's something that we do routinely. And uh, um, uh, I, I think the answer to the question is, is things are going countywide, not necessarily local. Mm -hmm. And so uh, could we deal a lot with Franklin County? And, uh, uh, and they're putting antennas on our Shutesbury and Coleraine Towers. And my suspicion is that we come to Franklin. If there was a <laughs> um, so let's return to Mr. Goldstein of InterOil Consulting and see if he found, we actually <coughs> found the email he sent us, um, which was a, was a rough estimate actually, um, because he didn't, he didn't want to use a lot of his time and thus, uh, uh, Vertex Tower Assets money to, um, do the actual, like, granular piece, but um, he estimated uh, 90 homes in Conway would be covered by um, mm -hmm. this tower. Mr. Goldstein, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, basically, there's nine, uh, in terms of coverage, there are 90 homes that have, there are 90 homes that look like they'll have solid coverage from the tower, and counting a somewhat lower probability or of a weak signal, 137 homes in Conway. And there will also be houses in Ashfield that are reached by this because this will fill in a gap in Ashfield. Um, not all the houses in either town are unserved. Uh, of the town, but so there are 152 houses in Ashfield uh, that will be served. And that includes that area that's now unserved. Uh, on the 116 stretch and around South Ashfield. Um, although, as you know, some of the houses uh, in the distance will overlap coverage. But it's a significant number, 152 in Ashfield with good coverage, 90 in Conway with good coverage. Of course, mostly this is aimed at covering a section of road, but it does reach a significant number of houses. Thank you. Does anyone else in the room have questions for inter -L consulting yeah. okay i mean he's here you can direct them to <laughs> um okay so that's immediate abutters and let's barbara. call on barbara 
Belgium. I'd like to clarify or supplement uh, Fran's answer to Hank Horstman um, about maintaining the road up to the tower. Uh, Kenny Boivert, who uh, owns, who rents the log house on our property, already plows. He, he has a plow truck, he plows other people's houses, and he already plows our property, so he's plowing anyway, most of the way up uh, to the tower. And if necessary, he could certainly plow the rest of the way up if, you know, if Vertex needed to get up there. Uh, they would just have to call him and he would do it. the members of the public and I would uh, want to recognize Conway residents first so somebody on the screen yeah, is raising their hand someone on the screen is raising their hand been doing okay, it so uh, yeah we'll get well, yeah so first we're going to recognize Walter Goodrich who I said I would and then the next yeah I, I just have a, a few questions um, can we see the maps online that showed the increase of coverage it was a blue uh, yeah. outline a green huh? it was green yes you can get to that and i'm also going to pass you the paper copy where'd that go here's the paper copy from um in <coughs> from the consultant yeah but it's black and white so yeah, it's, probably it's really hard to tell yeah. Yeah. it's really hard to tell you're right this i thought it was hard to tell color so, so is the I is the think. color one available anywhere yes yeah. Computer. Yeah, can you I, I can make it available? He's going to share it. It, it is. Will it, be on the website. Is it on the website? Uh, I believe Veronique sent me a message that Ruby has gotten it. It's an additional on link on the original. So we'll be on the oh, good. Okay, website. thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Sorry. welcome. Okay. Um, I had a question uh, for Fran. Um, when I spoke to cell phone companies who were interested in coming to our property, several of them said that they develop the site and then it's their practice to sell their ownership to another management company. Mm -hmm. What is your policy and what is your history? Um, we tend to develop them to get them built out and we have sold some. At some point it might get sold, but uh, uh, all of the restrictions and agreements would uh, travel with the tower to another management company. And could Conway make conditions that would um, give the town some authority over uh, or the, the, the new owner's responsibility? You mentioned that you would have a, a sign up there, you would have 24 um, hour uh, phone av availability. What about a new owner? Is there a way to make sure that we would uh, have a responsible new owner? Yeah. Um, any condition in the planning board and zoning board decision would carry over. So yes, and uh, uh, the, the, I believe the planning board addressed that in the previous decision and could address it here. Uh, 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 all, all of the conditions. Uh, that they impose and that we agree to would carry over. And just one other uh, general point of information. You, I'm just curious. You mentioned that the government is encouraging this development. How do they do that? Um, one, they're spending a lot of money, especially in rural areas, to assist companies to develop uh, both wired and wireless broadband. Uh, in addition, they've adapted to the laws to uh, encourage competition, which makes it more economically viable, and uh, to, uh, um, again, not restrict, but uh, um, assist towns in thoughtful permitting. Uh, like I said, the, uh, the town, uh, the, the, the government has laws that says to the town, you don't have to say yes, but you can't say no without good reason, substantial evidence, and things they, like that. So, uh, and, and it's designed, to encourage development for purposes like public safety and other things like that, to uh, and to encourage competition in the, uh, in the industry. Oh, I was just wondering if it meant that they encourage Vertex in 
among others, with well, monetary I would say the no, no, the industry no in general. Um, the, the industry in general. Uh, like several of our customers get grants to come out to uh, rural areas like Conway. Um, uh, there are laws in place that uh, um, facilitate the development. So it's not like we get um, economic, direct economic benefit, but we do in the sense that uh, um, it helps us develop more infrastructure. Sorry to interrupt, I can actually answer the question for you. So when- Who the, are you? I'm yeah, sorry, Chris right? Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Waldo, um, just full disclosure, I've worked in the telecom business for 25 plus years. So I know a lot about how, how it goes down. So what happened is when the carriers were purchasing the frequencies from the government, they had a clause in the purchase of the of those frequencies that those carriers had to put a certain amount of money into rural establishment. So that's where, not even just a law, but it was part of the deal with the disclosure of the sale of the frequencies that they had to put a certain amount of money towards developing rural areas and telecom in rural areas. So that's where they're pushing that. So that's where the money came from. Where does it go? Where does the money go? Yeah. Well, the, it goes to the government. The government owned the frequencies. The carriers purchased the frequencies that they used oh, for the telecom. Right. And it's a condition of the sale they need it. Yeah. Right. It's quite, a condition of the sale right. of more, the frequencies. It's more economically attractive to build facilities in Boston than Conway. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why, you know, uh, um, it's, it's been a, um, a challenge coming out to rural areas. And so, uh, um, and we make money renting space on the tower. We're real estate developers. Uh, but companies aren't, they weren't as quick to come to rural America as they were to urban America, except for what this gentleman said. They, they have mandates to come here because the need is here. It's just the population. They have mandates to come. Here. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, and, and you know, they they get licenses for a geography, and they can't say, well, we're only going to go to okay. Okay. dense urban areas and not suburban or rural areas. Uh, so, and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, over the last <coughs> year or two, there's even been more <coughs> focus on that because um, the companies haven't been doing you know, as zealously a job coming to rural America. So now they are, and uh, um, it's better for us as a real estate developer, but also yeah. better for the town of Tumblr. One last thing. Is it okay for me to inquire about what the status is of the other tower well, application at Conway uh, on South Deerfield Road? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, uh, we permitted that about two years ago. Um, uh, we have done most of our due diligence with respect to that, but the carriers are having supply chain issues as are we getting equipment. So uh, we've recently extended our permits with the town of Conway, uh, and we'll be building it as quickly as possible, but that's kind of um, an undefined term at this point. Just well, your maps are now on the screen if you want a question about them. Well, the maps you <laughs> I don't have a question, I would just like to have it. They're on the Look website now, study. too. On the They're on the website. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So just noting for the record that Mr. Goodridge is a, a butter of the other cell phone. The other cell phone, yes. Permitted from Vertex <laughs> Okay, so let's return to um, town residents. Town residents <laughs> from the Zoom who required, requested. Who's, who's Devlin? Who was there? Devlin Selman. Yeah. Devlin Selman. You're up, Devlin. I'm here to Hi. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions uh, regarding the tower. I, I arrived a little late, I'm sorry, to the meeting. Um, I got a postcard in the mail from Hilltown Health uh, just kind of giving us a little rundown about the tower. And it seems like this tower is uh, going to be 150 feet tall, and the uh, maximum height allowed is 120 feet in our bylaws. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. That is correct. That the reason for the joint public hearing is uh, the request for a variance on the height from the zoning board of appeals. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't really understand that. What, whoever was spoke. Sorry. I'm sorry. This is Beth, and the yes, there's there's a request for a variance on the height, and that is why this is a joint public hearing with the zoning board of appeals because they are ruling on the variance of the height. 
Okay. So that's basically where the top of the red balloon would be, the 150 foot mark? Uh, actually, the bottom of the balloon was 150 feet. I can measure the string. So the string was 150 feet, so the balloon was probably up 154 feet, 155 feet to the top. Okay. Okay, good to know. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I drive on that road. It's just a really, we have a really beautiful town. I mean, I'm, I'm all for cell phone service. It's great. Um, but I, and I want people to get, uh, you know, emergency help when they have it. I just, it's confusing because I have an iPhone and I have like an emergency call button. So I feel like that would work and it would, it would hone in on those, those, uh, you know, uh, whatever they are, the, the radio waves that would pick it up. So I, I, that's just one one question I had, and also with like the five G network um, having issues with like planes, like people, the the, the planes uh, were really concerned with people getting the new five G phones that it was going to um, interrupt the flights and, and radio, like the, the communication. So, but that was just like. Kind of alarming to me. I don't know what this this cell phone tower um, would produce if it's like for 5G phones. I, I'm really not super technology. Uh, I'm not smart in technology with all that stuff, but it's just concerning. My my aunt just had a brain tumor removed. Um, it seems like a lot of people are getting more brain tumors, and I know there's a lot of not well documented research on um, cell phones and, and brain cancer and all that. But it, it is a concern. I just wanted to express it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, another thing was, um, basically I'm going to butter to a, a 30 acre solar array and it has been a disaster. Um, I wrote an article in the reporter, um, that was published in February because we were promised everything was going to be smooth sailing. Uh, we were promised that the wetlands were going to be fine um we were actually threatened in the very beginning of the conservation commission um by one of the developers for next amp which left a really bad taste in my mouth and there's been really bad erosion that's been happening in the wetlands the stormwater um plan was not followed so my emphasis is really i want to drive home that the conservation commission which i really want to join and learn more uh follow you guys follow the the best plan to avoid erosion into wetlands because if the, if this is a very steep site you know and there's wetlands down below there's going to be definite erosion if you're just going to widen the the driveway the existing uh the cart the cart path i don't know what that is that was already there it's like grandfathered in you're going to use that road that's what exactly what happened here it was a logging road my neighbors use it as their driveway and next time made it into their entrance and they widened the road the driveway and now we have wet the wetlands across the street just have sediment and i dug into it this past week it was like a foot of sediment and it's really concerning because people just didn't follow the protocol they didn't think about the wetlands they didn't think about erosion they did but they just didn't do a good job so that's my second thing that i want to drive home is really please think about the wetlands um somebody destroyed a beaver dam across the street, all the water's running out of the marsh. We're having like one disaster after another. It's awful. So I really moved to, I moved to Conway to be surrounded by nature. And I just want people to understand that we live in a beautiful rural area and we need to like be thoughtful about the wildlife we have. And that's pretty much it for that. And one more question. We're, we're um, 30 seconds for the five minute comments. Definitely. Really, really, really quick. I just, I just want to get like a list of all of the places that you guys have developed Vertex. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if the DEP has, if you've ever had to deal with the, the DEP, if you've had um, to, if you've had any other problems. I'm just, I want an honest answer. Okay. Thank you for your comment. You're, okay. So the question. I'm going to answer the last question. Yes. We provided the town with several references. Our, our, our engineers are very thorough. Uh, and uh, we have nothing to do with the solar installation. Yeah. However, we've heard all about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, the planning board has been um, very diligent in making sure those things don't happen again and asking us for several assurances. Uh, but I think the best assurance we can give you is our reputation. Uh, um, we've given the, the, the planning board several references, both local. We have dealt with DEP very extensively. Our biologists are very familiar with DEP regulations. And if you just look at the site plans, 
you can see the efforts that our engineers took to avoid the wetlands and impact on wetlands. The Conservation Commission uh, had been out to the site already and uh, um, you know asked for some more um, um, protections of the wetlands. We're very conscious of it, and I can assure you that our reputation speaks for itself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there more people um, in the room who want to uh, ask a question or make a comment or on Zoom? You can raise your hand or put your name in the chat. Chris Waldo. Yes. Um, one first question is uh, transport, as far as circuit transport. Uh, what is being done for this particular site? Are you thinking about running fiber optic or is it going to be microwave based? Uh, we have rarely done microwave base, so I would say fiber, but we haven't, we don't bring in the transport, the carriers do, and that's also been a problem with the other site, is getting, um, and we've got other problems with other sites besides Conway in getting transport, um, but uh, uh, my suspicion is it will be fiber. Okay. Um, next question is, I, you know, obviously I agree with Bob and everybody else that, um, we obviously need the service. People are worried about the look. Um, from the drawings that you have on there, the monopole, it's great, it's not a guided tower, but the monopole looks like it's gonna be a trisector. Did you guys look at possibly doing an omnidirectional antenna as opposed to directionals? Um, the type of antennas that are used by um, wireless carriers are a sectorized antenna. What that means for uh, uh, an omnidirectional antenna is the type of antenna used by like public safety. It's more like a whip antenna that um, broadcasts in a 360 degree radius. The antennas that telecommunications use are more sectorized, uh, um, and um, and they're um, and to get 24 out 24. I'm sorry, 30, 360 degree uh, coverage. It's like they have antennas in three different sectors, a tri sector. Uh, uh, the reason why, too, is that they can position it. As you saw from the coverage maps, um, uh, the coverage objective is really the 116 corridor, and they can angle them and down tilt them. Um, so it, it's definitely a, uh, a sectorized tri-sector. Um, they will probably engage antennas to go to the north, but probably only one or two versus three going east and west because of the um, the objective for that particular site. But it's, it's definitely going to be all, all the antennas that all the wires get are, are, are sectorized antennas. If the site is decommissioned, whose responsibility is it to take the tower down? Uh, the town zoning ordinance requires a tower owner to take it down and for us to post a bond. Uh, I'll also tell you that uh, 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 the town asks us to provide an agreement giving them the authority to take it down with the money that we produced for the bond, which was a very novel request, but I found it uh, quite um, uh, thoughtful. And we've used it in many other towns. Oh. But, it a, but it was the first, I, and I, I applaud Joe, he was the one that came up with it. Uh, uh, it, it was kind of like a, 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 a gap in the logic. We yeah. use a bond, but it doesn't allow you to go on private property, mm -hmm. take it down, and Joe realized that. And so we now have used that in many other towns because I thought it was very thoughtful. Do we get a discount then? <laughs> <laughs> Last question is, you had mentioned a 60 by 60 compound. There's obviously got to be an access road to that. Is that already clear or it needs to be cleared? Um, the, the plans show a very uh, <coughs> long access driveway. I don't want to call it a road because it's really just a driveway. Um, and uh, it starts off with 116 over an existing driveway and then um, will be improved uh, over some clear land <coughs> and then um, um, constructed through the woods and up the hill. So it, it's, it's about, a hundred, it's, tell me, probably 1,500 feet, of which uh, um, I'd say uh, a third of that is already developed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there other people on the Zoom who are, who are trying to get their questions answered? In the chat, I can't see anything. What about other people? Other people who are not towers. 
Yeah. Now we have, if, if no other Conway residents want to pose a question at this point, we'll move on to um, other members of the public who are here. I'm a Conway resident. Oh, okay. I'm Jenny Michaelis, and I'm, I'm concerned. I don't really know about 5G. And I believe you said that it was highly regulated. And to my knowledge, that's not the case. And there are a lot of health concerns around 5G, and I don't really feel like we've got that. If, if I might, Mr. Chair, could you ask that question to your consultant? He's far better at yeah, we can. Than We're actually prohi not prohibited. What would the word be? We're constrained. I'm not hearing anything. Oh. Can she uh, step up to a mic in the room? Is she in the room? Maybe Beth, take your mask off because I think they can't hear you through the mask. What? Well, then, then move closer to Joe. Okay. Um, Uh, yeah. Okay. This is actually um, something that uh, local bylaws are not, we are not able to regulate. This would be an area that would go under the Board of Health, not under Maybe. Not under the Planning Board. I don't even it's, know. No, I'm happy to clarify it. Okay, we can we can ask. Uh, sure, can you state your name? Uh, Jonathan Mirren. I live in Charlemont. The reason that um, the planning board is not able to consider health in this decision is because in 1996 the um, the wireless industry was essentially invited in to help write the Telecommunications Act, and they were essentially granted a wish list of you know what. They wanted in that telecom act, and of course, one of the things in that list was um, that health uh, and environmental effects would not be considered. So, I'm just going to point out here that this is this is an opinion here. No, that, that's actually no, not exactly true. true. It's, it's, I mean, yes, that this it's well is, documented. Yes, and so basically, the short answer is um, we can't because of uh, because of FCC and, and government regulations. We we cannot. Uh, apply that to our decision making process. Beth, can I also say, as, as Fran mentioned, 5G is something that is years, okay. years and years and years away, or it may not even happen. It's, it's really hard to say what's going to. It, it's going to come. And again, I, I actually defer to your consultant, okay. but uh, we can, um, we can it's, talk to him. Uh, there's so much misinformation about 5G. Um, I'm going to give you a 30 second lawyer interpretation and then. Um, there's a, a, a frequency bandwidth. When the fire chief was talking about 400 megahertz moving to 800 megahertz, there's a spectrum of frequency. And telecommunications companies have been allocated certain bandwidth on that spectrum. And we generally operate in the 700 and 800 and the 1900 and the 2500. As demand has gotten more, they've expanded that. And so the future is 3500 and higher. And um, it's the same frequency band, it's just um, higher frequencies, and the federal government regulates the power output accordingly. But it's, um, you know, your microwave works at a particular frequency, your baby monitor works at a particular frequency. And so it's all on that same frequency band. Um, the reason why there's so much misinformation is because it's like the future and it's undefined. <coughs> and. Uh, um, and there are yeah. people that say, well, if it's undefined, how can you say it's safe? And that's a legitimate question. But it's the same technology that we've been using, just on the same frequency. So, um, and there's a lot of science and data to back that all up. Uh, um, the, the, the reason why it's so hard to talk about is because it's, it's still undefined. Uh, 
And so people are concerned about it because it doesn't have definition. But uh, um, it, it's, it's coming. Um, and, you know, and, and we demand faster connectivity. And you know, our phones used to talk, then they texted, now they sent pictures, and now you can access the internet. Well, pretty soon, um, you, uh, phones are going to be able to talk, to, uh, uh, cars are going to be able to talk to cars, and uh, machines are going to be able to talk to each other. And it's just, um, there's an immense amount of opportunity there. Uh, but people are concerned because they don't know what it is yet. And, and, uh, uh, but uh, to be fair, you know, the government is still regulating it and monitoring it. They're licensing yes. the frequencies. Uh, um, uh, to explain what Ms. Krishman was trying to say was that um, the government, uh, you know, it, it, they've really delegated authority to the FCC. And the FCC is regulating it by parceling it out, by putting power output limits to it. Uh, and they don't want cities and towns to say, well, we want 400, but not 800. We don't, uh, um, uh, they don't want cities and towns to say, we don't know, therefore we prohibited it because the government is making all those decisions. The, the federal government is making those decisions. It's regulating it. It's regulating it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. yeah, does, you, does Mr. Goldstein have anything to share with us about this? Yes, I'd like to address uh, that general question of 5G because that's a, as, as uh, Mr. Parisi noted, that's a very complicated, loaded issue. That 5G literally means in the telecom business, anything done since a certain date uh, on, on cellular, they declare 4G is done from now on, it's all 5G. It's not entirely new technology, it's an evolution, and it's a bunch of different things, got different frequencies. So. In terms of frequency bands, the first thing to note is this tower's job in Conway is a coverage tower. It's first mobile coverage of an area uh, that isn't served at all. It's a low density area. So they would cover that using most likely AT&T and Verizon use the 700 megahertz band. And uh, that would give, that's the coverage that uh, both uh, Vertex and I use uh, to demonstrate coverage is on the 700 megahertz band. Given the density and the frankly the very low density of use of the number of cars driving through the area, number of people at home using a cell phone at once, it's highly unlikely to congest the 700 megahertz channels. But the cellular bands, there are about a lot of noise coming in somewhere. Uh, but the, the 700 megahertz band, then there are others, the 1900 megahertz band, the 2100 megahertz band, the 2500. Now, T-Mobile uses the 600 megahertz band. Uh, that's because they're newer. They got those licenses more recently. They also have the 2500 megahertz, which was Sprint. And in this area, Sprint's coverage on 2500 wouldn't be very good because the higher frequency doesn't penetrate trees very well. And there are trees in the way. 700 gets through trees better. Uh, T-Mobile bought licenses for the new 600 megahertz band. Because it's new, they call it 5G. The main difference between 4G and 5G in that band is the arrangement of the software modules inside the core computer in the network. As far as the air interface on the air, you couldn't tell. It's almost the same thing. Trivial difference. And it's meaningless. But 5G also includes the 3.7 gigahertz band, called C-band. Um, it includes the 24 and 28 gigahertz bands, which Verizon calls ultra-wideband, and some other frequencies. Now, you get up to the 24, 28 gigahertz bands. Those are called millimeter waves. And they're different. Those have a short range. They have a range of maybe 150 meters of clear air. Nothing in the way. No trees, no buildings, no cars. Uh, I, I, I describe it as great for people who are outstanding in their field. <laughs> because if you're not outside your field standing there, you're not going to get it. And they deployed a lot of it and discovered it doesn't do much good. So now they're packing off that investment. But, you know, that was a little scary because higher frequencies, but in fact, they penetrate the body even less. And they're all very low power, just very hard to generate power. Now, the 3.7 gigahertz band, C-band, Verizon 
uh, and AT&T have both invested there. The problem is, you know, you've heard airlines. Well, some of the radar altimeters used for landing airplanes use 4.2 gigahertz. And there are some, not many, but some of the altimeters are such poor quality, they'd get interfered with if there was a 3.7 gigahertz base station right in the path near the airport at full power. Less than full, and the full power the FCC allows is more than 100 watts. It's so much power, nobody could afford to use it. They just set the limit very high. But if someone could afford to use it, they could interfere if they put that tower right underneath the landing strip. That has no relevance here because you're not within five miles of an airport. And it's, it's even less. It's about one or two miles of an airport you have to be for that to matter. Um, also, again, none of these other frequencies are likely to be used here because the point of this cell is coverage, not capacity. 5G is urban densification. 5G is how the phone companies, the mobile phone companies, can provide more capacity in Boston, city up, in New York City, in, in Brooklyn, and in uh, dense parts of Springfield, and in other densely populated, high-profit areas. But in rural areas, T-Mobile has the best 5G coverage, means the 600 megahertz coverage band, which is just next to 700, has no special characteristics as far as of how they affect the body. They, you know, slightly better range, minuscule difference. Uh, but you know, calling it 5G is you know mixing it with the rest of 5G is, is almost humorous because it's it doesn't even offer more speed. It's it's just newer architecture inside the software. So really, it's it's a real nothing burger. This is going to be a 4G tower. T-Mobile will call it 5G. Maybe AT&T at some point will name it 5G. And even my Verizon phone, which is not a 5G, lights up 5G because one of the features of 5G is operating on two channels at once um, for, on the same band. And, you know, again, it's not, they're the same old band. They just call it 5G on the phone to make it look good. So there's none, none of that's going to matter here because this is a rural coverage zone, quite honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Wow. And also, just to point out, as far as the health effect, one other thing I want to point out, there is one risk of cellular. When you're holding this next to your head, That's right. That's it's transmitting right next to your head. Now, if you're near a cell site, the amount of power your cell phone puts out goes down because it puts out just enough power to reach the cell site. The farther you are, if you're weak, if you're you know, one or two bars, it's transmitting at full power. And if it's next to your head, you know, I wouldn't want to spend all day talking on it either. That's why you want Bluetooth, which is very low power, to reach the cell phone a couple feet away. But the tower itself, you know, is less than 1% of the limit for safety if it were fully occupied. And it's not going to be that occupied. That's a theoretical limit. It's so far in the woods, you know, you can, you're not going to detect the power on the ground anywhere other than receiving it. Um, I live one within, you know, almost exactly one mile, between 0.9 and 1.1 mile, from three television towers, the Boston TV towers, where the TV transmitters are one million watts power. And so we're a little more RF in the air here, but the way those are safe is the towers are a thousand feet tall. And if you went a thousand feet above my house, it would be a lot of radio waves. Down here on the ground, it's a pancake pattern. It's safe. And the same thing applies here. It's designed to be safe at the ground level. The taller the tower, the safer. Is, is, is the other reason. So it's not going to be obsolete because of 5G, because you're not going to need to densify uh, past what this does. Thank you. That was that was very helpful. quite helpful. Thank you. Um, did, did you have a follow? Do you have any follow up? Um, I was just going to explain real quick too. Again, like they said, 5G just means generation. We're up to the fifth generation of technology with cell service. Yeah. There's absolutely no difference from the first generation that came out in the 80s to right now. It's just frequencies. The frequencies they're using for 5G, the vast majority of those were purchased from the government and those were used for the public broadcasting system on TVs. So that's why right now you don't have public access over your antenna on your TV because that was taken away, purchased, and is now being used for 5G. 
frequencies. The way frequencies work is the lower the frequency, the further the wavelength, and the further that frequency can go. Meaning if it's a 700 megahertz frequency, it can probably go up to two and a half miles. When he's talking about 2300, that means your wavelength is very short meaning it can't go a long distance. That's why a lot of 5G probably won't be good in this area because it has to get through trees, it has to go long distances, so it's nothing to worry about. I just wanted to put that up. Is there anyone else on Zoom who wants to speak? Uh, I didn't find anybody. Okay, anybody out there? Okay. Um, it's, unless there's other people who want to speak right now, it's 9.20, I'm noting. And, are you, are um, you um, going to call on out of Conway residents? Yes, okay. Yes, I will call on, on out of Conway residents. Do you want to speak to Yes, please. Okay, I'm calling on Jonathan Muir. Jonathan Muir in Charlemont. Um, if I ask questions, is that part of my five minutes or? Yeah, we're, we're asking people to be to yeah. keep it to a five minute. Okay. Well, I object to this tower um, for a number of different reasons. One is environmental justice issues. Essentially, the, the only real shot after watching Mr. Parisi apply in Ashfield and Rowe and Coleraine, the only real way for uh, abutters or people who live within, say, 500 meters of the tower mm -hmm. to, to beat this thing is to hire a lawyer. Low-income residents simply don't have the capacity to put a $7,000 retainer on a lawyer, uh, and that's what we take, and that I think is one of the reasons why it's really important to maintain this Conway bylaw of the applicant being a carrier. That's so that low-income residents, for example, don't have to somehow scramble to find the funds to fight this thing, um, just so that the tower eventually is not built, as is the case with the previous tower that uh, Vertex built. In the my understanding is it's still not built. So my suggestion would be that, you know, simply to invite Mr. Parisi to come back when the first tower is built and when he's partnered, at least, with a carrier. Um, another reason I object to the tower is because cell towers have a long history of catching fire. I'm happy to submit documentation about that. If you have an access road that's steep and not plowed in the winter, uh, it's basically a recipe for disaster. So I would, at the very least, try to put a condition on that, that the access road be maintained. Um, <coughs> um, I want to also point out that wireless infrastructure will always be slower than wired infrastructure. It will always be using more energy. It's not energy efficient. Um, the uh, coverage maps, are essentially predictive maps, which are computer generated. They're not based on actual uh, drop call data. And even the FCC now is requiring drop call data to prove gaps in co coverage. If the goal was really to cover 116, um, you know, there are ways to cover 116, as Mr. Goldstein has <coughs> attested in his <coughs> tower hearings. You could put um, what he was describing as 5G, long range 5G. Uh, transmitters along 116 to, to cover that road. Uh, that wouldn't be a profitable uh, business model for Mr. Parisi and his company. Um, it's interesting that the firefighter uh, firefighters were brought up. The firefighters who were based in Los Angeles um, received an exemption from 5G and any and other antennas going on their fire station because they understood that um, that led to, to injuries. Um, it's also ironic that Mr. Priest was referring to their concern about endangered species. Um, there's a, uh, Tom McCarty has a bird rehabilitation center directly across the road from where this tower would go. Uh, I've watched Mr. McCarty present at least twice and both times he uh, identified wireless radiation as a threat to birds. Um, it's absolutely true that this tower will become obsolete. Uh, at the moment, we've got now thousands of low altitude satellites around the Earth, that are, and essentially the vision here is that we're going to create a planet that is completely covered uh, by Wi-Fi, including by satellites that are designed to provide cell service everywhere. So there's, there's absolutely no doubt that anyone anywhere will 
have cell service, you know, when those satellites are fully deployed. And this rate layer of radiation will just be another layer. Um, I've watched Mr. Goldstein um, obfuscate and sort of pretend that there are no health effects because of um, the power. Uh, 100 watts, as Mr. Armstrong, I believe is your name, um, mm -hmm. talked about is essentially a, a, a red herring. The, the health impacts, and I'm not, I'm not objecting to this tower based on health impacts, but I just want to clarify because health was brought up by Mr. Greasy and by Mr. Armstrong and by Mr. Goldstein. The health impacts are linked to the modulation of the frequencies, not by the wattage. So that's where the science is. Um, if people want to, this is not really the appropriate forum to really take a deep look at, at health and, and the environment. So that's why we've arranged for a webinar with an expert. Um, Kent Chamberlain is going to be offering that webinar online on Wednesday, uh, May 16th. Uh, it's acceptable to everyone. I hope everyone can join. Um, and I'm also concerned about, um, you talked about transport. Essentially, if they're talking about getting using fiber to get to this tower, to get the signal to this tower, my understanding is there is no fiber uh, available that you're using Comcast, which is not fiber. So I, I just, my question is, if fiber's not there, the first tower's not built, the abutters who don't want this thing don't have the $7,000 to come here and fight it, why are we approving it? Why not just have them come back when the fiber's there, when the first tower is built? Um, those are my points. <coughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Diana Dapkins. I live on Patton Hill, 1,200 acres of beauty and an, an, an Audubon sanctuary. And I have now four towers around me, and I'm sick. And I had to have my house rehabilitated to the point where I could sleep in it. And these people are never going to stop. And I urge you to go to Americans for Responsible Technology, the website, Americans for Responsible Technology. It will, it will blow your mind, and it is documented. And I think you're all canaries in the coal mine. Thank you, Diane, for your comment. I'm from Shelburne. Thank you. Thank you. My last name is Dapkins. Thank you. And th when you get sick from this stuff, the number of tumors, this is insane. We didn't move out here to get sick. And, and yes, there's no public safety, but that's the price of living in paradise. Are there other comments? Definitely. Um, uh -huh. Before we, before we um, call on people who've spoken before, I'm just actually going to make sure that no one who hasn't spoken wants to speak. And I just want to confer briefly with my fellow uh, board members over here, the zoning board. Um, we are coming to a point where I believe it would be time to end tonight's yeah, fun gathering. And um, just wondering, uh, just going to check in with the board about um, whether we want to close this hearing or continue this hearing. Seems to me that if we, if Devlin is the only other person who needs to speak, then we would perhaps let her have a little additional time and then close the hearing. I close, close, close the hearing or continue it. Can close. Can, can, well, you want to, you want, you want to consider closing it totally or continue it to. I, I, I am satisfied with the information that I've received today. But okay, I'm going to poll. I'm going to poll everybody before I call them. What about you? I would okay. continue. Okay. Okay. What do you think? Close. You want to close? What about you? We're ready to vote, I think. So I'm You're ready to close. But, but at the same time, um, I was going to make a, a motion. The last two years ago, we ended up um, giving, um, granting the special permit and the variance at two different times during the year, mm -hmm. which meant when Fran had to come back for, um, for an extension, we were not at all synchronized. Yeah. So I would like, if you're going to have a continuance, I would also like to have a continuance okay. from, based right. on that. I, I, I want to have whatever our decision is contingent on you being ready to make a decision. All right. And I want to hear from um, George and Bill ab about their opinion on about um, continuing or closing the hearing. George? Uh, Beth, we're still having a hard time hearing you, so oh. we have to run that task again. Very soft. 
I'm sorry. Um, I was going to ask, I'm asking for the planning board members' opinion about <clears throat> whether this is the time to, you know, how you feel about closing the hearing, which would mean we would, we would stop taking public comment, and, um, or whether we would continue the hearing. Um, I would suggest the continuance date would be to our next regularly scheduled planning board meeting, which is May 19th, and we would, um, and it's a Zoom meeting, so we would continue it over Zoom. A question there. I think we've covered all the ground that that um, there is. I don't know that we need to extend the hearing. Other people in the town hall who haven't spoken yet. Uh, there's a few people who are gonna. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, what about you, Bill? How, what, where's your leaning here about closing or continuing? Well, I, I'm. I'm fine with closing the hearing at this point from uh, what I've heard so far. It it, may I just ask a point of clarification? If we close this hearing, then we will be deliberating at the next planning board meeting. Am I yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So, you, you, so regardless, you're but not. But we won't be taking public comment any. Right. I mean, we won't right. be taking public. Right. But you're not prepared to take a vote tonight, then. No. I, don't think we're, no. I don't think we're going to deliberate. Tonight. We're not deliberating. We're just tonight. trying to decide if we should close the hearing. Which means we would not accept any more. We would be deliberating at our next public meeting, which, to which members of the Can I have a point of order, please? Members of the public would be welcome to attend our next public meeting while we're deliberating. Yes, but but you know this part this part of the hearing would be. Can I have a point of order, please. A point of order. Okay. Um, I, I have never witnessed a cell tower hearing where. It was open the night and then closed the same night because people who are receiving this information for the first time, I mean, the, the, the maps were not even online for people to look at. So I cannot imagine really, I, I've never even considered that there would be a process where it would be open and closed in the same two hours because what you're saying is that no one can submit comments if you close it. Oh, well, so that's that, probably a good point because things weren't available until tonight. That probably makes sense. And you yourself said you only received information yes. today. Yes. You hadn't all. Had a chance to review. That's right. Good point. Thank okay. You. Thank you for your point. All right. So, um, so yeah. I mean, I didn't ask Andy. Is Andy still there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so we were talking about whether we're prepared to vote or not. But on the other hand, if the, the meeting is being continued, then we should not be taking a vote yet. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't see any reason to vote this evening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to... Um, Can I ask one more question about that, Beth? Yes. So this, if it's continued to next Thursday, mm, uh, week, week and a half from now, yeah. um, it's going to be entirely on Zoom? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um. So Beth, at this point, is it appropriate to entertain a motion to adjourn? Um, well, we First, did. we have to continue the meeting. Yeah, we so have. To a time to. certain, I think, is the point. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. that. So, so um, I'm going to keep, uh, we're going to take a public comment for five more minutes, and then we're going to move to the next piece of this. So, yeah, unless there's someone else in the room who wants to speak. Devlin, I think. Uh, Devlin, Devlin, Selman. Devlin, 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 We're keeping this to three minutes of comments now, please. Well, I'll just say one thing that I I want to hold off on uh, approving it. I object to it until I think more people can do a site visit and see how steep it is and get more input from the Conservation Commissioner. I'd like to see more documentation. I don't know if that's going to be available online. But just with my experience based on kind of being bulldozed by a company that's touting that they're doing good forever, like for the betterment of everybody, I just want more records and I want to see them. So if the town can provide them, that would be great. Everything is not okay. wrong. And, and Francis, if you can email more referrals or have more like a list or your website with everything that all of the, the, the jobs that you've done, that'd be great. I, I don't know that we're asking them for all of the jobs that they've done. I've given the references down. The only thing that I would object to um, is a site visit. This is yes, private no. property. Yes. We're and, not, uh, we're not. People are free to drive up and down Route 116. Yes. But this is private property and they're not authorized to own property. Yes. So we are, the site visit has been made by the Planning Board, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Conservation Commission. 
have also uh, done a site visit. This isn't an open to the public okay. site visit. There's some behind you. So. Yeah. I just want to make one quick comment. Can you give your name? Please? Alicia Marquez. I am granddaughter of the property owner. Um, oh, we have 46 acres. This tower is going to be in the way back corner. It, I like. I adore this property. It grew up here. Um, yeah. If I felt like our like our nature environment was going to be endangered, I wouldn't be say I wouldn't approve. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want it. Um, but the fact that Witch's Turn is right on like the dead zone. I've had my own pair of accidents there. If we get service, even in just like that little stretch that could save lives every winter, every year. Um, Conway is a town, I would say, of older residents. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> and I adore it. Um, but if we can get progress at least as well in keeping up with the times, I think it makes our town better. And my grandmother wouldn't be allowing this <coughs> at all if she thought our property or environment would be at harm. Thank you. Thank you for your okay. comments. Okay, so planning board people, zoning board people, we're going to, um, what's our next step here? We're going to continue this to okay. devote to continue. Yeah, we need a motion. I move that we continue referring to our next planning board regularly scheduled planning board meeting, which is May 19th. <coughs> 19th. Thank you. <laughs> I second the motion. We need a time. Yeah. We need a time. 7 o'clock. Uh, 7 o'clock over here. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. So the public okay. portion. So the public portion at eight o'clock. At eight o'clock. Okay. So that, let's redo that motion. Okay. I I, I adopt your friendly amendment. <laughs> Thank you. May nineteenth at eight. May nineteenth, and then for the public portion of the hearing. Yeah. yeah. We're going to continue it till then. Um, all in favor of that? Susan, I. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I. Beth, I. <coughs> Joe, I. We're hoping to hear from Joe and um, George and Bill. Sorry, you can't hear me. George, can you vote? Uh, I can't hear. <laughs> you want to tell me what the motion was? To continue the hearing until next, our planning board meeting, the next regularly scheduled planning board meeting. May 19th. 8 o'clock, at 8 o'clock, the public session of this meeting. You want to continue this hearing until May 19th at 8 p.m.? Yes. 8 or 7 Eight. Eight, eight is the public planning department. board meeting at seven, public hearing at eight. Um, I guess I'll defer to my, my uh, fellow board members who are present in the flesh in the town hall. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bill, Bill, do you have a vote? That's a yes. Okay. That's a yes. <coughs> Bill, would you yeah. like to vote? He said yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're a little in disarray here. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate everybody's time. And um, wait, you guys have to make the same motion. You have to make a motion. We're done. They have to make the same motion. I know they have to make the same motion. We will continue to vote. May 19th at 8 o'clock in conjunction with the planning. Motion. Uh, motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Don't be bored.